On life's journey, each of us seeks answers to the fundamental questions that define our existence. Who are we? What is our purpose? How can we find true peace and fulfillment? In the face of the complexity of the modern world, with its constant demands and distractions, an invitation arises to embark on an introspective journey, one that promises not only to reveal the hidden mysteries of our own soul, but also to offer concrete strategies for living a fuller and more harmonious life. This path does not require us to leave our daily lives behind, nor to search in remote corners of the world. Rather, it asks us to look within ourselves, to often unexplored depths where the true jewels of wisdom lie. Here, in the silence of our inner being, we discover an inexhaustible source of strength, peace and clarity that can guide us through the most difficult challenges and lead us toward the realization of our highest dreams. This journey is for those brave enough to question, to dream and to seek beyond what is presented before our eyes. It is for those who feel there is more to life than the daily grind and who are willing to unravel the secrets that lead to a more authentic and connected existence. Through a unique combination of deep reflections and practical exercises, a map is offered to navigate this inner journey, illuminating the path to greater self-awareness, understanding and love. A Book of Secrets Horatio Willis Dresser Chapter 1 The Secret of Success Every man wants to be successful. He may not know why or in what respect, but the love of power is innate, and even the lowest member of society is driven by an ill-defined restlessness, a half-conscious ambition, at least to realize the ideals of self-interest. Success in itself is a powerful incentive, for man is an imitative being. But success has many lessons to teach, according to the observer's point of view. What the world applauds the wise man may condemn, what one considers success, another sees as failure. Before we attempt to master the secret, we must agree on a standard that applies to all cases. Probably everyone who reflects upon it would agree that success crowns man's efforts only insofar as he expresses himself. A half-hearted work, an action that has aroused only a moderate display of power, is not what is called a success. In a successful enterprise, man rises as high as he can. Consequently, a successful work fulfills many objectives. It gives free rein to originality. It is beneficial to mankind. It brings material reward. It is a work of art. It is ethical. Its production is a pleasure. If our work lacks any of these essential elements, we feel it has failed. Success, therefore, is many-faceted. It is beautiful. Like the divine order, it is organic. A man may, it is true, subordinate all ends to the making of money and accumulate a great deal of money. Businessmen call him successful. But is his life, is he, a success? The probabilities are that he has used questionable means, that he has struggled day and night, and earned his fortune through the oppression of thousands. His work, therefore, lacks proportion, intrinsically and extrinsically. It has been done at enormous cost and sacrifice. On the other hand, if a man's work is sound, beautiful and is done because in it the man really found himself, it will surely bring a financial return, even though it was not produced with that end in view. Observing the law of proportion, of adjustment between various ends, secondary ideals are realized without working specifically for them. And surely, the making of money must always be a secondary end if man is an ethical, spiritual being. Moreover, since success is symmetrical, it is free from the painful reactions that follow when one tries to shape all things for personal ends. For example, when a man uses unscrupulous financial methods, he may not suffer immediately, but every unethical act must be accounted for. The only success that enables a man to rest in peace is the action that expresses, first, his soul, his heart, his conscience, and second, is true to every subordinate detail. If, then, success is primarily moral and spiritual, governed by the law of proportion, a man must know himself in many ways to be successful. The essential elements of success, inwardly, are a high ideal, self-knowledge, self-control, and self-cultivation, and outwardly self-realization tempered by the ethical recognition of society. A man may be on the road to success, 
when his conduct is subordinated to commercialism, or when he is the possessor of great wealth. But he cannot be truly called successful as a human being. And unless a man is a success as a human being, let us repeat, his work will never be truly successful. The welfare of others is essential to the success of every man, however independent he may seem. While thousands of people are in dire need, no millionaire can rightly be called successful. He may donate thousands to found charities or endow universities, but he cannot conceal the fact that the social organism of which he is a member still has a claim upon him. It is undoubtedly a law that the more man is concerned with the spiritual life, the less interest he has in material possessions considered to be of value in themselves. He values tangible wealth for what it brings and can certainly possess a great deal of it and still be human. He enjoys the world of nature and observes the laws of physics. However, he is likely to place little value on material things to be considered wealthy. Life is too precious to spend it on making money. We can relegate the financial standard of success to the lower order, where every true man has already subordinated what the world applauds. The man who aspires to spiritual success can anticipate classification as a failure by most men. He must also be prepared to face the taunts of people who contemptuously call him impractical. Success is supremely practical. A spiritual work is not a success if one must constantly be hinting or begging. It is not a success when one is kept alive only because compassionate friends from time to time come to the rescue with money and clothes. These acts of charity are sometimes pointed to as evidences that the spiritual law has been demonstrated. They are rather evidences of outright failure. They are sure signs of asceticism or fanaticism. A wrong view of life is betrayed by this spurious spirituality. As mentioned above, if something is a success, it is necessary for the world. If it is necessary, it will be supported. To the extent that it is supported, it fails to fulfill one of the essential elements of success. It is a pathetic fact that, because of their blind optimism, spiritually developed people rarely know when they have failed. It is even more unfortunate that, having criticized all business methods as commercial, they resort to means and methods that fall far below the standards of the honest businessman. An understanding of the multiform constitution of man is thus one of the credentials of success. Another essential is a knowledge of natural law. Why does nature succeed? Because it is meticulous and never hurries or tries to evade even the most insignificant stage of evolution, and because it seeks the line of least resistance. The successful man takes much time to think. He carefully examines the terrain, looks for weaknesses and strengths, then adjusts himself to the necessary conditions. He is patient, considerate, balanced. He manages his energy. He waits for the right occasions. When the right time comes, he strikes bravely. He gladly learns the lessons of partial failures and having discovered the remedy, wastes no energy in regrets or promises. He is the man of action, the willing worker, a faithful believer in himself. He is wise enough to have more than one activity. Both work and play are organic. His avocation counteracts his vocation. He is not only a partisan, but primarily a seeker of truth. He may serve a cause on occasion, but this is not his best work. He is not a proselyte, but a brother. Thus included in the secret of success are many other secrets which we will consider in these pages before pronouncing the final word. The art of health is one, the art of work is another, the art of social adjustment is a third, and we shall have something to say about character. Here is what one man indicates as the secret of his success fidelity to the spontaneous impulses of his higher self. For those impulses have somehow paved the way for each of the subordinate essentials. Dedication to a life's work, says another. Tremendous capacity for work, say others. Thus, each man learns the same secret in his own way. The sooner he comes to a trial, the sooner he will begin to succeed. It is a partial help to affirm success, but there are no real paths to it. There is no formula for success. The power that called us into existence has bestowed upon each one the possibilities of success. And though it may be a partial success in the external world, it will be perfect in the world of the soul. The secret of success is, in short, to live by the Spirit. 
All other methods must fail in part. The multilateralism of man is the form which the creative life assumes. This must be thoroughly understood and faithfully developed. But it is spirit that gives life to this form. True beauty is of the soul. And though everything called success has educational value, in the end it is only the soul that succeeds. Chapter 2. A Secret of Evolution One of the great lessons of the ages is this multifaceted ideal that we have found to be the form of success. The Greeks understood this law of symmetry, and not only chose beauty as the ideal of practical life, but described the universe in terms of order, beauty. But the tendency of the more spiritual nations was decidedly narrow by comparison. In India, the spiritual man became a hermit or monk. Throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, the ascetic life prevailed among the spiritually inclined. The body was despised, culture was allowed to fall into oblivion, and only the determined effort of the leaders of the Renaissance finally brought about a reformation by a return to the Greek ideal. In all ages, the noblest Christians have tended toward one-sidedness, an overthinking of the spiritual world, a total dedication to a life of self-sacrifice, tends to this result. From a certain point of view, no career is so noble as that of the sacrificial Christian. I would not for a moment underestimate this ideal, but the world has gradually reacted from this extreme position, so that today very few advocate a strictly ascetic life. Moreover, the Greek spirit has so persistently worked its way into the Christian life that we can no longer call ourselves simply Christians in the old sense of the word. We are assimilating the Greek life into the Christian spirit. The Greek ideal was self-realization, the symmetrical development of all our faculties and powers. The Christian ideal, as enunciated by Jesus, was love, humility, service. And we are learning that there is no conflict between individuality and service. There is no need to mortify the flesh or repress the artistic impulse. The more cultivated we are, the more skillful and beautiful, the more truly we can serve. The same lesson nature teaches us. Nature knows no excess. She advances by slow and easy stages until her products are artistically complete. She is organic. All her products are organic. Nothing is complete in itself. Everything must serve. And the great result of this service of parts, this cooperation of organs, is at once Greek and Christian. It fulfills the ideals of beauty and love. Thus, the ideal of all evolutionary development is symmetry. Our being consists of body, reason, conscience, the social instinct, the feeling of worship, and reason assures us that we must give adequate time and thought to all these. We must take physical exercise, we must nourish the intellect, we must be morale. We must express our affections, serve our fellow men, and manifest the religious spirit. If we attend to all these, our life will be solid, beautiful, true, noble. On the contrary, if we suffer, if we are distressed, miserable and unhappy, we may know that we have been guilty of excess. Sickness is excess. Pain is an expression of excess. Its cure is balance, moderation, equanimity. Consequently, the remedy for every defect is beauty, proportion, organic adjustment. First, know yourself as a rounded being. Discover your needs and tendencies. Second, learn the way nature realizes the ideals of beauty and love through gradual evolution and adjust yourself to the rhythm of nature, remembering that impatience is ugliness. Finally, summon the powers of the mind by playing in calm but persistent contemplation of the rounded ideal. It cooperates with nature in thought. Adjust philosophically to all that she aspires to achieve through you, thus you will learn that harmonious lesson which every human experience is designed to teach. Thus you will gradually overcome the diseases and torments of the flesh, the ugliness of thought and action, and the unbridled tendencies which formerly led you to constant excesses. Chapter 3. The Secret of Adjustment Socrates declared that his work in life was to help the developing mind to express its ideas. By skillful questioning, he would first learn his disciples' point of view, then, by raising equally skillful objections, he would force the young mind to defend itself and thus deliver his full message. Thus was born in full life among the Greeks the method which is now the pride of what we call the new education. 
and thus was outlined a philosophy which Henry Ward Beecher summed up in these words, Discover the path God is taking, and then go in that path. The best thinking of our time recognizes this philosophy as the essence of wisdom in all our dealings with life. The fundamental fact about the universe is that God resides in it, promoting its evolution. The fundamental fact concerning human life is that the soul is imminent in it, demanding expression. Every philosophical and practical endeavor must take into account the fact that the conditions which enable God and the soul to manifest are secondary in importance. God and soul come first. The adjustment is not to the rhythm of the external or educational process, but to the inner power, the life-giving life that attracts the conditions essential to evolution. God is not to be judged by the passing event, which may inadequately reveal him, but by what he is doing throughout the universe during all ages. The soul cannot be truly understood only by this or that action, which may even misrepresent the true man, but by his life as a whole when viewed from the standpoint of motive, individuality. The external expression will always be imperfect, for the soul advances incessantly. The real is what man would be. The actual is only apparent and, like all appearances, is partial, limited. The actual is great only through its suggestion of the flying perfect. The actual passes and is forgotten. What the soul sought to achieve but only partially achieved endures forever. Only by considering the actual in the light of the ideal can we truly help to create the ideal. For creation is not artificial fabrication, it is the evolution of the spirit toward the fullness of life. All educational methods err to the extent that they seek to rearrange circumstances from without. Only the soul knows the needs of the soul, and only the soul will provide the necessary power to readapt the environment. First learn the rhythm of spirit, then you will truly know the innumerable rhythms of the flesh and of all evolution. Know the laws of the soul, then you will understand the laws of its objectification. Some theorists err in being overly concerned with the inner life, without due consideration of its measured manifestation. Others become so absorbed in the process that they forget the reality which the process manifests. The highest ideal of adjustment is to remember the soul while being mindful of the conditions it progressively attracts. To cooperate with God, we must know and choose God's ideals. These are varied and multifaceted. God creates not only for pleasure, but also for profit, not only for truth, but also for goodness and beauty. To pursue an ideal is to be mutilated, as if life were valued merely as a process, not as the instrument of the soul. Therefore, adjustment requires the keenest discrimination. A thing is good in its proper place, in the proper relation. No faculty, no tendency, is adequate by itself. To feel to be deeply emotional is noble if the emotion is balanced by organic adjustment on a scale of values. Life is first for feeling, then for thinking, now for science, and now for art, sometimes for contemplation, and at suitable times for action. Divine life flows through all the channels of existence, including every portion of the body, and he is wise who neglects none of these. Error is an aspiration toward truth, potentially imminent in it. Ugliness longs to be beauty, evil seeks its completeness in good. Disease is lack of symmetry, its cure is the attainment of proportion. In all its multiform tendencies, the divine life is moderate, rhythmic. In every adjustment between tendencies, moderation is the lesson of life. Each tendency may have its rhythm, but all are characterized by that harmony of movement which promotes beauty, peace, balance. Therefore, the secret of adjustment is the ideal of all art, and every true artist knows that the greatest possibility of his life is to build upon the imminent tendency or beauty of the object before him. As nature is the landscape of God, so the body is the landscape of the soul. You may look in vain in the visible world for some of the features portrayed on canvas or marble by the great artist, but he truly saw when he worked. You may marvel at the lover's enthusiasm when you see the face of the beloved, but you will no longer question when you truly perceive the beauty and nobility of the soul. Thus, the key to all that resides in the outer world, as well as to that which simply comes and goes, is deep-seated beauty, love, truth, 
goodness. Seek these, and you will find the rest. Seek these, and your life will become a permanent adjustment to the constantly flowing life of God. Chapter 4. Social Adjustments Sensitively organized people seldom need to be reminded of a fault. They need encouragement. There is an art to receiving criticism graciously and benefiting from it, whatever its source and whether it is fair or not. It is equally difficult to criticize to avoid hasty, superficial and cruel judgments. Just as it takes two to make a quarrel, it also takes two to restore harmony. It is almost impossible for some people to admit that they are not innocent, that the other party in a dispute is not the only one who must change. Be willing to own up to a fault, even if they recognize far more than their fair share. When one harbors a critical spirit toward another, everything that person does is misinterpreted. When two members of a household agree on the shortcomings of a third, the latter suffers a serious disadvantage. In such cases, the defect is usually magnified. In general, an ill wind blows when two people put their heads together. A newcomer to a household at odds tends to think he knows exactly where the problem lies. He assumes he knows people better than those who have summered and wintered them. After a quarrel with a friend, both are inclined to stay away and let the other reconcile. This is selfishness. It is superficial criticism that rejects a person as soon as limitations are seen. Criticism should be varied, judicial, never simply negative. Rightly understood, it is appreciation, never fault-finding. Let go of negative criticism and people will treat you better. Familiarity breeds carelessness and impoliteness. Is there any reason why one should not be as courteous to a brother, a mother, a wife as to a stranger? There should be total frankness where there should be total harmony. Sincerity is absolutely essential to friendship. Where there is domestic disharmony, there must be mutual understanding as a remedy. Love is the greatest remedy. But better understanding is also essential. Some err by yielding too much, others by not yielding enough. Do not use pressure. If another does not see the wisdom of your advice, grant him the freedom to experiment. Life means development. Do not expect pure happiness. Awaken the soul. Remember the ideals that your fellows are trying to realize and do not emphasize the rudimentary conditions of their evolution. Concentrate on the ends rather than on the means. Remember that your judgment of another is, at best, only a point of view. It is the other's life as you see it. They may be wrong. When we discover flaws in ourselves or another, we tend to magnify them, like letters on a printed page that are magnified under a microscope when removed from their relationship to neighboring words. This effect is often intensified by error in causation. We often blame ourselves and criticize ourselves for faults that are due to uncontrollable circumstances. Self-condemnation and judgment based on appearances often lead to the erection of obstacles in our path, where more careful scrutiny would have given a more charitable turn of mind. A person may appear reserved when he or she is suffering from pain or problems that a stranger might not share. Or one may appear cold having a wealth of unexpressed feelings. One may have had great affection to give that was rejected by misdirected rejections and loves. Some are considered reserved when they sometimes tell more than they should, while others are so discreet that their true feelings are a mystery. One friend may think he understands another, when in reality there is an unimagined depth of inner experience that is revealed only to those in sincerest sympathy. A seemingly dull moralist may even be brilliant in relating tales of travel or personal experiences. Separation from friends is often due to misunderstandings, lack of candor regarding some new experience. In married life especially, there must be total mutual understanding on every point. The sensitive mind easily closes in on itself. Your help must come at once with love. There can be no true friendship without equality. Even if one is much wiser than the other, there must be equality of spirit. The true friend is loyal, patient, never demanding. In true friendship, there is always mutual respect, never the familiarity that intimacy sometimes leads to the uncultivated. If one has put oneself on display to gain an advantage, it is best to remove the mask at once. Allow the bubble of idolatry to burst as soon as it is discovered. True love never becomes an old story. True charity is no respecter of persons. Hired friendship is an absurdity. Equally absurd 
is impersonal friendship. Spontaneity and disinterestedness are evidences of true friendship. He who distrusts others first distrusts himself. Sometimes a world of trouble is caused by those who, assuming that they know what is best for a friend, rigidly, dogmatically hold that idea and communicate their erroneous judgment to others. What right have observers to assume that they know better than the individual soul? Is not true guidance in all important matters of life, the choice of a vocation, of friends, of husband or wife, a direct address to those who are to be companions in such friendship? Others may point to certain considerations, but where is the court of last resort, if not in the sacred precincts of the soul, in solitude free from all dominating influences, how can the mind be so easily deceived by selfish desires, personal preferences, social and financial considerations? What is more contrary to spiritual law than the attempt to manage another, to marry him to advantage? Has anyone the right to intrude into that sacred world where marriage is holy? What is more important than overcoming all obstacles to divine guidance and thus granting freedom of individuality to all mankind? Can any judgment based on observation, astrology, graphology, palmistry, occultism, or phrenology be compared with the inner impulse of the soul. Suppose that impulse conflicts with these secondary judgments. What of that? Of what importance is it to a man who has received the guidance of the soul? Should he not be true to that, even if all the world condemns him? How disloyal it is to accuse a friend of inconsistency, because, as we think, we do not understand his motives. We do not know what impulse may have come in the tranquility of his soul. Be loyal, even if your friend seems to act in contradiction to your professed doctrine. He may have excellent reasons for departing from his usual course. Circumstances may sometimes compel you to make unpleasant disclosures, to speak plainly the truth, though at the risk of reputation, business, and social position. A statement of fact is not a personal attack, even if the truth it reveals proves another to be a hypocrite. The ideal of a harmonious social state is illustrated by the playing of a symphony orchestra. Each musician must be an artist in his special sphere, but subordinate his instrument to the harmony of the whole. Each is essential. However, the beauty of the symphony is the fusion, the ensemble. Harmony is organic. It is composed of mutually dependent, contributing parts, cooperating in the realization of a common ideal. From the moment we stop expecting what a person or a place cannot give, we begin to discover virtues to which we were previously blind. There are times for silence and times when, if another grants the opportunity, one can speak freely and give valuable advice. But, until the right time comes, there is nothing to do but trust, even if one sees that a friend is under a spell. A friend is a true friend who can help another to get rid of a hypnotic spell but all pleading is useless until the victim learns that he is a victim. It is amazing that one mind can dominate another for months while the subjugated person is unconscious that he is a slave. The spell hangs over the mind like a fog at nightfall. It settles and solidifies like a shell, commanding the servile brain as a disembodied spirit is said to control a medium. It leads a man to think he loves a woman for whom he had no natural attraction, it weakens the mind and degenerates the body. The higher nature is imprisoned for the moment, so that even if it knows everything is wrong, it cannot resist. Women doubt that their female congeners have such powers, but it takes a man to discover a woman. Conversely, the woman knows the man, as the man does not. How strange when onlookers think they have discovered a romance, and the man or woman in question is totally oblivious to it. A mere platonic friendship, how quickly a philosophical friendship becomes the personal. Will there come a time when all this impatience will cease and spiritual law will rule? Would that a continuous philosophical friendship were possible? Then it would not be necessary to be reserved at the moment when personal emotion appears. The power is deep and subtle that binds two people together. One should not expect to understand it through self-analysis. The phenomena of infatuation are subject to analysis. But love does not come that way. Doubt is not always a safe guide. For what is more natural, when one has decided the great question of marriage, than that everything that might arouse opposition should be agitated. All doubts are superficial and transitory in comparison with love. On the other hand, no thought is so deep 
so reliable, so persistent as doubt, when one is simply infatuated. There is a big difference between thinking one is in love and actually being in love. The criterion, always the innermost whisper of the individual soul in the silence of free solitude. How much harm a random word can do. For instance, when a young man and a young woman are often seen together, the remark is made in their presence that puts the idea of marriage in the young man's mind, when such a thought would never have occurred to either of them. Again, it is some comment that, like a poisoned dart, sticks in the heart of an otherwise beautiful friendship. To most, no doubt, it is a mysterious fact that a prophet has no honor in his own country, that relatives are the last to recognize the wisdom in one's ideas. But the reason is not hard to find. The people at home have seen the prophet in his gestational years. If by chance he revealed his inferior self, they surely knew it. When a rumor comes from abroad that he has accomplished something, the countrymen think, how can he do anything? I knew him when I was young, he did such and such. So every negative characteristic is remembered. What other people applaud, the villagers condemn. If the prophet returns and tries to introduce reforms, he is considered impertinent. If he works for the cause of truth, he is condemned because he does not support his former church or society. Even when he marries, he is supposed to have degenerated, yet his fellow citizens will surely flock to listen to someone from another state who doesn't know the half of it. There are those who might tell stories about this imported prophet, but fortunately, this man's gossip has remained at home. And so, misunderstood, it is no wonder that the prophet goes where people believe in him. But is there any reason why familiarity should breed contempt? A married man said recently, with feeling, that he would be happy if his wife idealized him as she did before their marriage, seven years before. Then she saw only the ideal. Now she looked at the negative stages of his evolution. Before marriage, his idealism was a tremendous incentive. Now his propensity to find fault had become such a burden that he had to look elsewhere for encouragement. So it is a regrettable fact that husbands and wives often have as little honor at home as the prophet in his own country, and for the same reason. A husband will pass over a book without reading it because it was his wife who recommended it. When a stranger speaks of him, he thinks it must be worth something. A wife will consult a stranger when she needs advice on a difficult point. Then she will return home triumphantly with the new wisdom. But the husband had possessed that wisdom for a long time and had expressed it many times. A parent will dismiss a child without giving a moment's consideration to the wisdom offered even though it is knowledge the parent had long sought. A brother or sister will despise for years the new ideas of another brother or sister, until finally a stranger imparts the same valuable doctrine and it is believed. However, if they possess their senses, no one is better placed to appreciate genius than those who see a person at close quarters. The whole problem consists in the neglect of true idealism. Always the loss is on the side of the one who condemns, the prophet prospers even if he is condemned at home. He would not be a prophet unless he possessed unshakable self-confidence. It is a burden to be misunderstood, but appreciation comes after a time, and one learns to be superior to adverse criticism. Emerson saw all this when he said, Guilt is surer than praise. To be great is to be misunderstood. When a man advances from ignorance to knowledge, he realizes retrospectively that his earlier judgments were conditioned by his state of development. If he hears another man making the same prejudiced statements, he knows the reason. If he is reflective, he does not condemn, for he knows that a man's judgments are limited by his knowledge and experience. Herein lies the basis of tolerance. We know if we stop to think that our knowledge is largely conditioned by what we have read, seen and experienced. If our scope is limited, our knowledge is light. What a New Yorker thinks is probably different from what a Turk thinks, because the conditions are different. So customs, philosophies, religious and practical methods differ. Thus, individuality is encouraged. The problem starts with the assumption that my way or my thinking is better than yours. The problem begins in the home. It flourishes in the religious world. It conquers in the political realm. The problem becomes tyranny when we insist that our way must be our neighbor's way. Drive this thought home for a moment 
and consider how many times a day you insist that your judgment is right, your method is right. You fail to remember that your thinking is only your point of view, that though you claim divine authority for it, it is but an individual opinion. You forget that your way may not be wise for another. You insist that others accept your judgment as valid. Others may have opinions. Your word is law. A large part of the impatience that causes domestic inharmony stems from an unwillingness to allow others to work out life in their own way. We insist that others accept our truth and accept it now, forgetting that truth is only such when demonstrated by individual experience. We also forget that difference of thought and life is the main source of the variety that makes our social life pleasant. In deeper truth, no man can see for another. Chapter 5 Secrets of the Age The light of a great revelation is emerging among us during these wonderful years of transition. Men and women everywhere are awakening to the knowledge of the sublime fact that no barrier separates them from the spiritual world. All around us is a great spiritual realm and a transcendentally beautiful presence from which comes all life, all wisdom, all love and power. What looks like death is only a new birth. What looks like a carnal prison is, in deeper truth, no obstacle at all. He who has awakened to the consciousness of that surrounding realm and that sustaining presence passes from one plane of life to another as one travels from town to town, and all who are still in the flesh may also commune with that world of worlds, that reality of all realities. He who dwelt on earth for a time 19 centuries ago advised men to seek above all that kingdom, to be faithful to its law, to live its righteousness, and to make known its love. If we could see him now and know the extent of his glorious work, we would find many thousands of times the number of followers who once forsook all for him. We would be uplifted by the love and purity of a multitude of presences. We would receive from all the readiest help and the sincerest sympathy. But we need not wait to be free from the flesh. The greatest triumph is to live the spiritual life now. And we can confidently open our consciousness to the great world of the Christ, the universal brotherhood of consecrated souls, knowing that their fellowship will sustain each and every one of us. This is the great revelation of our time. This is the great gift of one century to another. And if you would truly know the age at its best, open your soul in prayerful receptivity that you may feel the forward pulse of the imminent creative presence that carries all things toward the realization of the Christ ideal. For a new life is awakening in the hearts and minds of men and women today. It is a new vision of the Christ. For many centuries the death of Jesus has been emphasized. Today what is essential is the life he lived. Men have long sought to save their souls. Today the motto is service, unceasing work for the betterment of mankind. Once men were frightened by the fear of hell, warned against the temptations of Satan. Now they are inspired by the glorious possibility of heaven on earth, while Satan has revealed himself as selfish humanity. Once the emphasis was on dogma, doctrine, and ritual. Now, in these remarkable days of renewed interest in the gospel story, the emphasis is on the spiritual simplicity of Jesus. So the transformation continues, and few are those who can say how far the change will go, or how fast it will come to the heart of heart and the intellectually cold. The day of mere liberalism has passed, it is no longer in order for liberals to hold love feasts and congratulate each other because they have held liberal views for 40 years. Today the cry should not be, look how advanced we are, but look, the harvest is plentiful and there is no time for mere liberalism. Soon the liberals will be the conservatives, unless they also begin to serve. For the great movement of our time is the return to Christ, the social Christ, the elder brother, whose gospel is the salvation of the poor, the oppressed and the afflicted. It is wonderful to see how many have felt this human touch, this new and practical Christ. Critical observers declare that these people have returned to orthodoxy. In truth, they have returned to the spirit. They have grown weary of cold metaphysics. Their hearts have warmed once again. They have a deep longing to help humanity. Human religion has taken the place of supernatural theology. When a man feels the social touch, he wonders how he could have spent so much time on matters of lesser importance. The day is coming when no man will be called a Christian unless he lives for humanity as Jesus lived. Jesus was, above all, a man of sympathy, of love. 
he responded freely and promptly to any call for help, to the opportunities that were nearest at hand. He did not stop to investigate scientifically. He did not stop to argue. He did something. He gave himself completely and freely. There is a cycle here that many people go through before this vision of the living Christ comes to them. At first they are orthodox members of the church. Some incident arises that accelerates liberal thinking. Doubts follow thick and fast. There is an awakening to freedom, a realization that dogmas and doctrines have been hard masters. There follows a separation from the church, and the atmosphere of the great free world is so delightful that for a time the church seems the grimmest prison. One cannot find words strong enough with which to condemn the priests. There follows a loss of reverence for everything religious, and after it advances gloomy agnosticism. This period lasts until the soul again hungers for spiritual nourishment, then begins a gradual reaction. The feeling of reverence and worship returns, and the New Testament is read with new meaning. Finally, the reaction is complete. The church once more occupies its usual place, though it is revered for its spiritual ideal, not for its creeds. The new freedom is retained, but with it is mingled all that was hastily discarded when dogmas and rituals were abandoned. All that is most noble and beautiful, all that is most sacred in the church, now assumes its true place, and there is great rejoicing that the days of wandering are past. With the return of faith, there is a strong tendency toward the concrete, the practical, it was the old abstract theology that sent men out of the church. Deep in their hearts, they really loved the Christian life throughout the whole period of doubt. What they needed was a practical doctrine to complement this faith. It has arrived. Our age is both social and practical. The great revelation is this discovery of the practical in the spiritual, the social in the religious. It is a new revelation of the individual as much as it is a social dispensation. That which was once limited to systems, creeds or books is now proclaimed as the possession of each individual, the revelation of God within oneself. Thus, while this dawning cycle is the age of renewed spiritual faith, the recognition of a surrounding spiritual world, it is also the age of democracy. Heaven was once supposed to be the final dwelling place of the elect. Now we know that heaven is democracy, the universe for the people, God was once considered an aristocrat, a caster of creative fiats from his secluded throne. Now we know that the true father is the father of the people, that creation is gradual and ends only with the emancipation of the people. There was a time when a priest or pope was supposed to be the vicegerent of God. Now all people have access to the father. How absurd seems the pomp and splendor of those who, by royal blood, have considered themselves rulers of the people. Rulers. Who dares to speak of kings and queens in these enlightened times? The rulers are the people. They allow certain individuals to enjoy the joy of appearing to reign for a time, but how easily they could snatch the scepter from the regal hands of titled rulers. If you meet an artist or author in search of inspiration, suggest to him to portray this democratic idea. If you meet an inventor who has created a new and valuable machine, tell him to dedicate it to the people, to beware of the temptation to make money out of it. The land is for the people, the fair and fresh landscape of nature. Therefore encourage the men to work on the land, do everything to keep them in the small towns and in the countryside and out of the big cities. Let us make nature the home of democracy. Let us carry the democratic ideal into all departments of thought and realize it in all spheres of action. Come down from your pedestal and be a man among men. Open the blinds, and let in a little warmth. This is the age of democracy, of the return of faith in Jesus as our elder social brother. Chapter 6. A Christian Secret There is one phase of Christianity that has been persistently overlooked until recently, the application of Jesus' teachings to health. This omission is largely due to the dogma that the healings performed by Jesus were supernatural and therefore the age of miracles has passed. The moment this dogma is discarded, all must admit that the healing of diseases was a prominent feature of Jesus' work. It soon becomes evident to the mind that it is impossible to fully understand or be true to the Christian ideal without studying the relationship between the gospel of health and the gospel of salvation. No argument is needed to demonstrate to an impartial mind 
that with Jesus, these two Gospels were one, that this was one of the secrets of his success. He came to seek out and regenerate those who were lost in the wilderness of sorrow, trouble, sickness or sin, of whatever kind. He had power over all these conditions, and to be a true follower of him is to apply the Christian spirit as extensively as Jesus did. It is remarkable that Jesus spoke of sickness and sin synonymously. What was the basis of this identification? Everyone admits that sin arises from the individual, but sickness is generally assumed to be of external origin. If the theory of sickness implied in Jesus' teaching were true, sickness, like sin, would be disloyalty to the divine law. Whatever its external origin, it is primarily due to wrong conduct emanating from within. Jesus states unequivocally that what comes from within definitely is a man. Even being angry, harboring lustful thoughts, is considered tantamount to actual conduct. Throughout Jesus' teachings, there are references to the inner world as the source not only of man's wrong living, but also of the regenerating thoughts that purify him. For him, health is wholeness. He often declares that he whom he has healed is made whole. He who is whole is healthy in mind as well as in body. His inner life is beautiful, his outer life is consistent with it. No man who is morally sick is in perfect health, nor is a sick man morally upright in every way. For the moral law is a law of the total universe. It applies to everything. It is the law of purity. To be sick, a man must be in some measure impure. To be complete is to be clean and beautiful in every respect. What makes a man complete? Jesus sets forth the means to this end in two ways, to be free from sin or to be united with the power of God through faith. Your faith has made you complete is repeated over and over again. What constituted that faith? The recognition of the power of which Jesus was the messenger and the belief that this power could accomplish anything. At times the crowd tried to impede the work of that faith, but the man of faith cried out all the more vehemently until Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Another sufferer was content simply to touch the hem of his garment. Still others were so tormented that, in the language of those ancient times, they were possessed with many demons. Even in these cases, we find that the power of God is recognized. The unconquered or sinful part of man's nature cries out in pure despair when it is finally in the presence of the Christ. There is no kind of sickness that Jesus does not heal. He refrains from performing mighty works, only in those regions where there is so much lack of faith that there is not yet receptivity for the righteous life, which is the remedy offered by Jesus for all diseases. It is evident that he could have worked cures in these less enlightened places, but he was not wise, because healing was for him the occasion to impart a lesson, to point out that kind of life which brings freedom from sickness. He emphasizes the correspondence between receptivity and regeneration, faith and what faith desires, zeal for righteousness and integrity. There was much more he could have done, but he devoted his life to those who needed it most, most ready for the Christ. Throughout his gospel, Jesus emphasizes love, a life of service, self-denial, selflessness. The great truth cannot then be hidden that this righteous life to which he called all men was the life of health, of wholeness. There is a close correspondence between selfishness and disease. If health is righteousness, anything that savors of unrighteousness is more or less unhealthy. If a man wants to be healthy, let him begin to love, to serve, to go out of himself. It seems mysterious and at first sight irrational to say that the first procedure for a sick person is to think of others. But study the lives of sick people, especially the wealthy, and note the conclusions to which you are forced to come. It was said by one who was trying in his humble way to heal as Jesus healed, my most difficult patients are only daughters and single women living in boarding houses. Why? Because only daughters tend to be spoiled and wealthy pensioners have time to feed their ills. The first step in many cases is to persuade the sick person to find something to do. Probably every reader of these words is thinking of sweet, cheerful, patient sufferers to whom the above does not apply. It is not denied that sickness can be a means of grace. 
But what sort of thoughts habitually fill the minds of those who have time and money to be sick? How long would they remain sick if their conscience were as full of faith in God as those whom Jesus healed? But you say the afflicted people of 1900 years ago could see the living Jesus, beholding the radiance of his face. Undoubtedly, this was a help. But the Christ is here now. We have not only the record of the mighty works performed by Jesus, but also the evidence of all the Christian centuries in which the power sent by Jesus has been at work in the minds and hearts of men. God exists today. The Christ is in all men. Faith can accomplish so much. What Jesus uttered is still as true as it was then. It may take greater faith to believe in the invisible Christ, but we are more developed and have greater power. It is a greater sin if we do not have the faith. Therefore, Christian healing is faith in God, Christian righteousness. As Jesus calmed the choppy waves of unbelief when his disciples were so troubled, so should we walk on the water of our troubles, stand firm in that purer region, above the angry sea and utter those magic words, Peace, be still. Jesus could thus command and find that even the winds and the waves obeyed him, because his will was one with the Father's, because he lived the righteous life. Righteousness in anyone has a similar power. It is only because of one-sided Christianity that diseases have not been cured over the centuries by those who have felt the spirit of Jesus. Too much emphasis has been placed on sin and too little on that other aspect of sinful living sickness. The greatest error has been the emphasis on sin rather than on the way of escape. As long as righteousness was supposed to come through supernatural grace, and as long as Christian healing was considered miraculous, the day of salvation was postponed. Now we know that both grace and healing come through the law, through receptivity and faith. There is no longer the slightest excuse for not applying our Christianity to even the most threatening diseases of the body. Chapter 7. Another Secret Through disloyalty to the gospel of Jesus in its fullness, it has long been maintained that Christianity is essentially a religion of renunciation in a negative sense, that Jesus was primarily a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering. Consequently, great emphasis has been placed on these characteristics and certain new doctrines have been spread by critics of Christianity who assure us that a religion of joy has finally been found. Is Christianity necessarily a religion of sadness and renunciation of self in a debilitating sense? Is the error in Jesus or in the interpreters of Jesus? Jesus came with the good news that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He came to bring life and immortality to the light. Not only did he heal the sick, but he freed the mentally imprisoned and enlivened the soul. What could be more joyful? What could more surely summon the latent individuality of his hearers? Jesus specifically affirmed that he who renounced himself would find his true self. Man was not to renounce and lose, but to consecrate and gain. Therefore, Jesus' doctrine was far removed from the debilitating attitude inspired by Eastern pessimism, an attitude to which the renunciation taught by Jesus has often been compared to the detriment of Christianity. In spite of all negative statements to the contrary, Jesus was primarily an optimist, in contrast to those who, despairing of an existence in which man was bound to gross materiality, declare that our external life is evil. He did not urge men to annihilate desire. It did not inspire zeal for nirvana, nor did he denounce the body. The ascetic conclusions derived from his doctrine are derived from false premises, which Jesus never established. Jesus regarded the world of nature and with it the body as a manifestation of the glory and wisdom of God. He taught that man was to take care first of the possessions of the soul, but all external things were to be added in right relations when man had found his true life in the invisible realm. Thus his doctrine was in all respects positive, where the critics referred to have given it a negative interpretation. It was practical. This was the great secret. As for Jesus' knowledge of pain and suffering, that was due to his compassionate sympathy. We should not understand by this that the Master emphasized pain, that by having a serious countenance a man becomes Christ-like. We must recognize the pain and the need for help, but look beyond them to the compensations of the spiritual life. The emphasis should be on the good news that reveals the deep meaning of suffering. 
One is inclined then to believe that those who thus disparage Christianity actually overlook the deeper joy of the gospel and substitute a shallow complacency in themselves in which sympathy is notably absent. A broader view would seem to reveal the joy of Jesus for the first time in its true light. Instead of mindlessly rejecting and discrediting him, one should rather rejoice that now, finally, certain obstacles to a true interpretation have been removed. And instead of carelessly declaring that Jesus need not have suffered, it would be better to look beyond that suffering to the greater joy that apparent renunciation reveals. Chapter 8. The Secret of Pessimism a clergyman who had long suffered periods of intense depression and animality once confided to me the secret struggles of his soul. He was well past middle age and consequently had a fund of experiences to draw upon. For many years, captivating spiritual visions were occasionally interspersed with his ordinary thoughts, visions in which he seemed to be lifted to the most exalted heights. For the time being, he dwelt with the God of his orthodox belief, with all the angels, saints and prophets. No one could be happier, as long as the vision lasted. Then followed days and days of despair, during which his mind was filled with the most ungodly thoughts and desires completely foreign to his better self. It was incomprehensible to him that one who sought spirituality above all else could at times be so carnally inclined. In questioning my confidant, I learned that when the supraterrestrial visions came, he would surrender to them in ecstasy, determined not to let them go without his full blessing. Then came the apparent curse. Here was the cause of his depression. The pendulum must swing as far in one direction as in the other. Excessive bliss was followed by extreme depression. Thus the mystery was explained. If the man had calmly contemplated the vision, letting his soul assimilate what it wanted, naturally and easily, there would have been no reaction. There is a natural law of capacity for spiritual food as well as for material sustenance. The soul knows what it can profitably take in. It needs no coercion. That this is true is shown by the experience of many who are naturally extremists and ascetics and who have acquired moderation in all things and have learned to approach every experience with equanimity. Asceticism is a disease. Moderation is health. Therefore, the art of self-control is inseparable from that of health. Ill health is in many cases simply the habitual and intensified reaction that closely follows undue emotion or ecstasy. Pessimism is the usually extreme mood that accompanies physical excess or disorder. He who considers the world unwholesome and impure is himself unbalanced and unhealthy. Excessive consciousness of sin or the fear of having committed the unpardonable sin is simply the pessimistic reaction of excessive contemplation of an idea. Morbid self-consciousness is simply excess. Pessimism is undue emphasis on one side of life. It by no means follows that optimism of thought or temperament means sanity in philosophical thought. The optimist may be as blind as the pessimist. The inbred optimist may be a shallow puerility. True philosophy of life must be a synthesis of all points of view. Generally speaking, however, the pessimistic mood is more likely to be tinged by a pathological condition. It is usually a vision in the dark, through the darker tissues of the flesh. Evidence for this conclusion is found in the fact that depressing and despairing emotions tend inward and downward. There is a closing down, a sinking to the depths, accompanied by an increase of doubt, self-criticism and despair. The mind is absorbed in its own sorrows and pains, it seeks solace in contemplating the sufferings of others, the prevalence of misery. The world is condemned for being so degraded. God is despised for creating such a world. Worse calamities lurk on the horizon, and death crowns all. The optimistic vision embraces a vast range of phenomena unseen by this gloomy introspection. It is light, hopeful, joyful. It looks far and beyond, around, up and out. It is synthetic, comprehensive, limitless. Whatever comes, it knows by a secret intuition that only good can come. Those who possess keen self-knowledge and power of self-control are intimately aware of the first symptoms of pessimism. At a crucial moment, it is possible to close or to open, to sink into the flesh or to rise quietly above it. To seize the optimistic alternative is to escape the evils of sensuality 
and turn the same energy into the production of hope. It may be that one misses something by rising above the sensual level, but that experience is of little value if it must be completely recast in another mold. True, if one could conquer every regret, one would be decidedly a loser. No one wants to be a stoic, but the powers that be will send us sufferings enough that we cannot escape. There will come pain, unexpected defeats, and multiple obstacles. Let us allow them to teach their lesson and be grateful. However, no one expects to rise and fall forever. There is a well-balanced state where one can look up or down with equal serenity. One can be in a world of regret, but not be of it. To the extent that we can conquer it, it is probably right. That man is simply an animal who yields to all moods. As we shall see in another chapter, there is a noble balance between feeling and thinking. The man who possesses self-control can let himself go if he wishes. Thus he possesses a tremendous advantage, even over one who has a greater capacity for feeling. What we could have done but did not do has a far greater moral significance than what is easy. Every man is both angel and devil. There is little merit in being an angel if you have never faced temptation. To the one who overcomes, not to the one who merely feels, more and more will be added. And the ideal situation is to have both optimism and pessimism under your control. What relevance this has to the problem of evil, the reader will readily see. To understand pessimism and to know how the mood arises or the habit grows is to master a whole phase of human life. What one saw as in a dark mirror was of course true in its own right, but when daylight came one corrected a thousand illusions. The pessimistic mood was then labelled and kept as of retrospective value only, as a contrasting effect by which to judge the value of optimism. For when a cure for depression is found, a way of escape from pain and sadness, misery and calamity, insofar as these enclose, why should one continue to view life pessimistically? Pain is not an evil. It is nature's indication that the normal limit has been passed and that a process of restoration has begun. Death is not an evil for one who views life from the standpoint of the eternal now, where the soul continually resides. Nor is our unethical life evil when considered from the point of view of moral and spiritual compensation. These things seem absolutely bad only to those who have not learned the way of escape, who do not know its meaning. To judge the world by these things is to make a great mistake in reasoning. When one finds in the life of peace, balance, moderation, multiplicity, a complete solution for these excesses, when one discovers a principle of inner activity by which these tendencies can all be conquered, a complete change of judgment takes place. One knows not to judge while the darker mood is present. One must wait for the day, and little by little the nights become shorter until the day becomes practically continuous. Only when the pessimism has disappeared does one see its true character. But we are telling the sequel before the end of the story. Now let us return to consider other aspects of the art of self-control. Chapter 9. The Secret of the Work Some years ago I had the opportunity of observing several day laborers at work. The land around an old house in a country village was being improved after years of neglect. It had to be dug, leveled, and trees cut down. The laborers were inhabitants of the old, conservative villagey. The contractor was from another town and had fallen victim to the commercial spirit. His men worked by the day, but the contractor worked with his men to push the work to make his contract as profitable as possible. The contrast between the day laborer's method of work and that of their contractor was very noticeable. The day laborers lifted the shovel with measured pace and rested a moment between each swing of the axe. Evidently they had learned to handle the shovel and axe rhythmically with the least expenditure of energy so that they could work all day, day after day, week after week. But when the contractor lifted his axe, one blow followed the other with surprising rapidity. He was an extraordinarily strong and energetic man, capable of doing two days' work in one day. The observer could scarcely help admiring his initiative. His corpulent body had already endured years of this ambitious work. Many months passed, when one day I learned that this contractor was seriously ill. I don't know what illness the doctor diagnosed him with, but probably as he was a doctor of the old school, 
it was said that his patient had some well-classified malady. The man was sick for many months. The following summer I saw him working as vigorously as ever, apparently not a whit wiser. Why did one man fall ill while the others worked without interruption? Would it have mattered much what kind of food the men ate? Could religion or philosophy have been the determining factor? No, it was mainly a difference in the way force was used, the difference between chaos and order. I no longer care what you call that force. No man, no woman, under any system of diet, philosophy or religion, can overdraw nature's regular supply of force without paying the penalty. The collapse can be long delayed. By an optimistic thought process, one can temporarily rise above the nervous reaction. But sooner or later, there must be a reckoning. To know the cause of overwork collapses, we must understand the temperament of the individual. We must know his secrets, how he uses himself, whether he smokes and drinks, or is a victim of some kind of excess. In the case of a woman, we must know to what extent she is a slave to habit in all its imprisoning forms. We must study men and women in their occupations, learn how they work, observe whether they have learned to rest, discover the degree of self-control, the type of consciousness. Behind all disturbed mental and physical activities, there is an incorrect adjustment to the forces acting upon the soul. Everything depends upon the degree of inner consciousness. The soul that has come to judgment possesses a power of which the ordinary man does not dream. Most are creatures of habit. Only the well-balanced soul knows what it means to preside over the genesis of action. For no small degree of self-control is required to stem the tide of impulses that sweep men from birth to death. When life is finally characterized by serenity, a marvelous change occurs. Instead of forcing the body, instead of forcing the brain to think, one works more with the spirit. One discovers lines of least resistance, one expects occasions, one learns that higher guidance comes spontaneously, that an enormous amount of time and energy can be saved by simplifying one's life, so that only what spirit approves is carried out, while everything else is allowed to pass without regret. Yet this great secret of the inner life is the same principle that every wise man learns, whatever his occupation. He obeys the same law of rhythmic moderation when he leads his horse on an all-day journey. The experienced mountaineer observes it when he makes a day's ascent to a rocky height. The successful manual laborer has mastered it. In countless ways, the secret has been conquered. But many men who have mastered it in their profession are slaves to passion or some excess outside their chosen pursuit. The art of work must be applied in all departments to be truly successful. There is a secret of secrets, an inner law of self-control. To know this is to have possession of all the lines of activity that constitute a human being. Many who are outwardly calm have roaring volcanoes and circular sores within. The art of the arts is to know how to be still in the center, even if we are outwardly furious. Do you realize how tremendous is the possession of self-control, the secret of the work? Do you know that it is possible to be so moderate in all your ways that your inner life is in perfect adjustment with the rhythmic functioning of the body, thus making disease impossible? Do you realize that self-control means control of the soul? Otherwise it is mere pretense, that the soul is an immortal spirit and commands forces that can actually accomplish what is called impossible can control even what almost all men think uncontrollable. If you realize this, a tremendous responsibility rests upon you, a responsibility which embraces everything from the religious life downward, a responsibility which shows that the self-controlled man must be selfless. There are other aspects of the secret of the work, for example, knowledge and dependence upon the subconscious mind, but these are all natural results of composure or calmness. We are considering them in varying terms throughout this volume. The essential point at this point is economy of energy. It is impossible to separate the art of work from the art of health, and here is our secret of pessimism in another form. Pessimism is a waste of strength, the sorrow of one who does not know how to live. There is a joy in the higher and rhythmic way of working, of which the pessimist has no conception. Something is wrong with us if we do not rejoice in our work and the victory over that impediment is the very triumph we are considering in a different form in each chapter. Chapter 10. The Art of Health. Sometimes the complaint is made that because of the existence of disease in the world, 
God or the universe has not been just to us. If only we had been created hale and healthy, so runs the complaint, we might have a chance in life. But many of us are so hampered and handicapped that we are practically useless. To test the validity of this criticism, suppose one of these critics is suddenly restored to perfect health. He is, we will say, a nervous wreck after years of nervous hurry and agitation. Health comes to him by a miracle, that is, without bringing knowledge of the method of cure or the cause of his disease. How long will such a person retain his health? Of what value is a mere temporary covering of the effects a merely external cure if the person learns nothing as to the fundamental origin of the disease, or suppose all pain were eliminated from the world? This would be paradise, some say, for pain is synonymous with evil. But if pain were eliminated, what would warn men when they overdo their work? What would compel them to rest or to nurse an injury? It is easy to see that human life would be ruined in a few days, with some in a few hours. For the vast majority of mankind, pain is the only balance wheel, the strict necessity without which they would kill themselves a thousand times a year if they had so many lives to lose. Even if all present suffering were eliminated and nothing else changed, men would immediately develop it again. No one should expect to be confined in a city, living on rich food, staying up all night, running the bodily machinery at full speed, and at the same time be free from pain. It is one of the wisest dispositions in our great universe that the moment man departs from the natural, from the moderate, in any direction, he suffers pain. It is only the lesson of pain that is gradually teaching men to be wise, serene and well-balanced. Without pain as a warning, we would in fact have no clue as to the sanity of life. Diseases of human origin, that is, disease as we suffer from it, not to mention the diseases of plants and animals. For if man were healthy, he could avoid all external contamination. Man has turned away from nature, he has turned away from the ideals of simplicity. He lives an artificial life and suffers the consequences. Therefore he alone is to blame. He has caused his ignorant misery, of course, and it is because he is ignorant that he condemns the universe. Still, ignorance of the law does not excuse him, and the fact remains that he has laid the foundation of his own painful life. The remedy is not far to find. Man can enjoy all that, in his opinion, the universe has deprived him of. He can have health, he can be free from pain. But if he desires such freedom, he must pay its high price. In the first place, he must study himself, learn his habits, how he can best work, under what conditions and toward what end. Secondly, he must understand disease, how it is developed by the way we live, how it is transmitted by wrong living, and how it is increased by wrong treatment. In all this, he must be very broad, not limiting himself to mental or physical causes, not tracing all disease to a disordered stomach, and not expecting to find perfect health by simply becoming a vegetarian, eating only two meals a day, or simply affirming strained ideals. As disease is an expression of our whole wrong life, so its cure must come by a complete change in thought, habit and methods. Man must learn the great truth that health is moderation, balance, harmony. It is useless to change from one cult to another, hoping to find peace when one remains the same fanatic or extremist, still tyrannical, anxious, nervous or selfish. It is life that must be changed. One can be healthy under almost any form of belief if one is moderate, sane. The essential thing is to be at peace, to understand oneself, how to live, how to stay well, not simply how to regain health. The art of health, then, is the art of life. It is the art of adjustment, the secret of power. It is another form of the great art of success. For health in the deepest sense is inseparable from the particular vocation to which we choose to devote our strength. Chapter 11. The Secret of Self-Help If I were to meet an angry crowd on a city street and try to calm the agitated mass by coercive measures, threats and violent abuse, the crowd would become even more furious, perhaps pounce upon me and kill me. But if by chance I knew the cause of the disturbance, I would approach as a brother, a messenger of peace, uttering words of sympathy and wisdom, my listeners would feel the calm power of my words, and the agitated crowd would calm down then it would be possible for me to make a full explanation of the difficulty at hand. The first method would be blow for blow. The second would not be passive resistance. It would be the triumph of a greater power 
over a lesser. The illustration exactly typifies the relation of two methods of coping with painful sensations, to face pain on its own plane, to become absorbed in it and fight against it, is to intensify it greatly. To turn one's attention away from it to a higher plane of consciousness is to diminish its power and gain a decided advantage over it. The crowd karma first becomes calm, centered, serene. Then he calmly considers the situation so that he can utter the decisive word. And emptying his mind of all feeling except sympathy, he calmly but forcefully and confidently declares the wisdom of the situation. The effect is magical because it removes the wrong apprehension, because it is the word of power, of irresistible peace and intuition. He who seeks relief from a threatening sensation must obtain with the same resolution a calm perspective. Absenting himself for a moment from the multitude of fluctuating forces, let him rise to the height of a philosophic vision let him seek the solitary places of the soul and walk in the paths of the spirit. All such solitary places are refreshing and all such paths are peaceful. Every crowd is a burst of excess. Every painful sensation is an expression of excessive activity in some form. Therefore, one must become extremely moderate in spirit, voice and manner. The energy that would naturally have been expended in a sudden burst of violence must be distributed through successive moments of well-exerted force. If the violence or the crowd turns back on itself, let it rebound. Keep calm and watch, letting the power work, but ready to give a new impulse when necessary. If you can keep yourself free from the process of the crowd, the process will take care of itself. Do not think that you must reason with every man. Deal with the mass as a whole. Speak the word of peace and adapt yourself to the response. Nature is competent to take care of the rest. A word of peace carries a power that no calculation can measure. Wisdom has a weight that no error can bear. It is the truth of the situation that calms the crowd, the real facts presented with wise persuasion. Likewise, it is truth that frees the sick. The sufferer is sick in mind and body, of course, but he is greater than his sickness. He is a soul, a child of God, who is wisdom, love and peace. As a soul, he resides not only in the body, but on a higher plane, the surrounding spiritual world where God acts directly. As a soul, he has the power to transcend the multitude of his sensations and become the man of wisdom, to appeal to the living Christ whose word of peace calms the turbulent sea of the lower life. From one point of view, it almost makes no difference what the problem is. God's wisdom is a remedy for all ills, his peace has power over all circumstances. That peace and that power are open to every soul, for God is omnipresent. Every man and woman are his children. The Christ exists for all mankind. Therefore, the essential thing is to seek this wisdom and peace, to ask for guidance in dealing with the case at hand. When guidance comes, it will reveal the truth of the present situation. When peace is perceived, it will bring the power to calm the crowd. Here is perhaps the deepest secret of human life. This is the great truth implicit in the preceding chapters. Man is a dual being. He is not only the being who seems to succeed or fail on the external plane. He is not just the one who learns externally the secrets of evolution and adjustment, the art of physical and intellectual labor, of optimistic and pessimistic moods. Nor is it the complete personality exemplifying the Greek ideal of self-realization, the total man. There is a being within who uses all this as instruments, a being who lives not only in the temporal world, but in eternity, a brother of the Christ, a child of God. He who has found that inner self can succeed beyond all dreams of relative or external success. He adjusts himself to what moves within and behind all evolution. It works with a finer rhythm than the rhythms of brain and muscle. It has resources of which unenlightened man does not dream. It triumphs over conditions that would overwhelm anyone who is not thus enlightened. When the tide of mob violence and selfishness sets in, he is undisturbed. Calmly and confidently, he transcends all contending forces that may arise. In all moments of doubt, pain and sorrow, he is equally aware of the source of help. He knows that to yield to the opposing tide is to be swept away. 
he must not yield one iota. He disconnects himself from the lower plane and opens his soul to the higher flow of forces. Then all that comes from below is powerless. The lower may writhe and rage, but it cannot free itself. He who is thus centered can wait until the storm has passed. For the decisive moment is the ascent from the lower to the higher, the change from the merely human to the divinely guided and sustained. Chapter 12. The Secret of Action. For a long time it has been customary to regard human existence as fundamentally a life of thought. All idealism is founded on this assumption. It is the basis of many popular doctrines. But gradually the conclusion has been changing, so that the tendency now is to include activity as equally fundamental. The conclusion is important for our purposes, for it sheds light on that crucial transition of which Emerson tells us that it is seldom taken, namely the change from thought to conduct. A reflection reminds us that belief may or may not influence behavior. Just as a sermon may go in one ear and ineffectually out the other, so many other thoughts may be impotent unless followed by action. Someone has said that fear is the backbone of disease, but it all depends on the emotion that comes with the fear. It is the emotion that wreaks havoc. Fear does not inevitably produce disease. Whether a man is thinking socialism or Vedanta philosophy, the vital consideration is which of his many thoughts is chosen as the guiding factor in action. If the man is expending his energy twice as fast, neither socialism nor Vedanta will save him from nervous breakdown after years of such excess. However, if his religion has given him peace, that is a foothold on which he can build a new and balanced man. If we were mere machines, quiet doctrine might mean quietness of life. But we have fanatics always before us as dire warnings of what can spoil any form of religion or other doctrine. The will has a decisive role to play in all these cases, and volition can unleash a torrent of excess. Ideals are of inestimable value in evolution, but after all it is the dynamic or subconscious realization that is the potent factor. When I am running at full speed, it is helpful to say, peace, be still. But if I cut off the power within me, like the engineer who grasps the throttle lever and cuts off the steam, the headlong pace is conquered. Observe that the soul is fundamental to both thought, will and deed. Thought may be superficial, will may be weak, but when thought becomes the end of action, a result inevitably follows. Therefore, the new dynamic attitude of the soul is the secret of action. Man is an active being. Let us remember that. He is not a thought. He is not limited to thinking as a means of self-development. He can take the reins of power and take real control in the center. It's a small area, this little center, where you take the reins. But... Like the throttle of the locomotive, it regulates a vast machine. The man who knows how to slacken or increase speed at critical moments possesses a power so mighty that he can laugh at what would terrify the creature of emotion. For this little domain is at the center of both mental life and bodily activity. The whole mind will be at ease if the center is at peace. Circulation, respiration, the digestive system and all other functions of the body are affected by it. Simply to know how to reduce the heat of the body by taking control in the center is to be able to conquer certain diseases at their onset. And if a man can conquer disease, he can conquer his passions. He even has the power of life and death in his hands. I would not write these words if I had not tested every element of this theory. When a man has consciously saved his life as the engineer slows down a locomotive, he knows what he is talking about. The great secret is to possess the soul as a power center underneath and to control emotion and thought. For there is another state deeper than the merely mental, a state so much more vital that the soul can bring all things before it for good, even when both mind and body are directed toward evil. Let us deepen our grasp on this great truth by contrasting feeling and thought. How do we come in contact with the world? Is it through thought? Do you think you touch that tree over there and so touch it? If a stone hits you, do you think you are hurt? No, you feel it. Whatever you think, you are made to feel that you are in the presence of a world that is objective to thought and will. You come into closer contact with that world, not when you think, but when you act. The most real world, then, is the world of feeling. All our pains, joys, 
loves, are of this character. The term feeling covers the widest possible range, from raw sensation to the highest religious feeling. Feeling, arising and emerging in activity, is essential to life. Deprive us of this and we cease to be. What really matters most to us in life is feeling, that which makes us love one another and unite, that for which we strive most sincerely, that which we seek to interpret. Spiritual life would be nothing without it. Feeling is direct, immediate, from the moment of birth. Thought is indirect and has a history. We feel more in a moment than we can understand in years. Thought is imitative. It represents feeling. The idea is not the thing itself, but an abstraction, a phase of feeling, an image, a formula, or a sign. In our scientific and theoretical pursuits, we tend to forget this distinction. We become so absorbed in ideas and controversies that we make the symbol the symbolized. We even fight over words. We defend favorite abstractions as real worlds, abstractions that have almost no connection with fact. No wonder we substitute artificial methods for concrete methods of growth and reform. A little sensible reflection shows that what we are really trying to accomplish is to readjust ourselves to the forces, to cultivate certain activities and let others die. We call upon the intellect to help us, but when we have understood we must begin to act. Feeling is the consciousness of force, acting and being acted upon. No phase of existence is deeper except the soul feeling and reacting. It is through feeling that we act, that is, we act when the soul, overcoming resistance, accelerates or institutes a new direction of force. It is not the thought, but the decree emitting a dynamic attitude that does the work. The thought is an image of the chosen end. The act is the means to that end. I can sit by the window thinking of myself walking up that hill. I can wish I was there but I begin to move there when I initiate the activity that overcomes the inertia of my sitting posture. Distinguishing between the relative value of feeling and thinking is a far cry, however, from contending for an emotional life. Emotions are usually superficial, transient, and conflicting. The man who is controlled by his emotions is a fickle sentimentalist. He lacks balance, sanity. To get underneath all emotions and thoughts is to discriminate between alternatives of feeling, to discover a finer quality of feeling. This finer state is spiritual, intuitive, composed of love educated by wisdom and acted upon by the soul. It has been tried and tested. It has been deepened through years of experience and reflection. The soul knows God by intuition. It knows its own existence and that of the world by the same immediate and habitual relationship. There is no space between. A similar immediacy unites the soul with the forces that play upon it and the forces it controls. Therefore, to assume a new dynamic attitude is for the soul to bring about the emergence of a new intuitive relationship with these forces. The soul may, it is true, be passive and so yield to an emotion or thought. But I am speaking now of the higher process where the soul is not only receptive but decides which feeling or thought to act upon. A thought can be made dynamic by reflecting on it long enough to leave an impression on the deeper energies. This result is achieved by maintaining center, regaining calm, equanimity. It comes through harmonious adjustment, not with physical sensation, but by cooperating with the power behind and beneath it. Or it arises when the idea has taken such control over the mind that one subconsciously yields the vital forces for its realization. The ideal is the focal point around which energies gather when sent forth to a new duty. It absorbs the attention, lifts the mind to a higher plane while the soul concentrating upon it adopts a new dynamic attitude. Suggestion without a dynamic realization may be ineffective, but a center of calm, peace, equanimity is a constant and unfailing source of power, whatever the passing thought or emotion. This is how the man of balance and habitual self-control confronts and conquers an angry mob where all others would fail. The angry mob is driven by ungoverned emotions. Each individual composing it is a victim of unbridled force. Misconceptions play their part, of course. To convey right ideas is to calm the mob. But if men had self-control, they would not be victims of a mob. In the work of pacification, 
everything depends on the manner of presenting the right ideas. It is composure that wins. A lawless man would be unable to calm a mob, even if he communicated the truth. The man who fights the mob fails, because, to use Emerson's phrase, he goes down to meet himself. He gives back as force the same force. To calm the lawless mob, he must use a different force. He must ascend to a higher plane. The force that would naturally express itself in violence must be sent forth as peace. So transmutation of energy is the secret. This is the sovereign cure for all war. Every man wins this victory who masters his impulses. The well-coordinated man knows how to help others to achieve self-control. He who can turn to the higher plane can influence the multitude as easily as he once responded to the stimuli of anarchic suggestion. Yes, far greater are those powers of the soul in the domain whose peace passes all understanding. Therefore the alternatives must be considered as two streams on two levels. The soul can ascend from the lower to the higher level and send the very force that would be harmful to bring forth good. The lower current flows through the narrow forms of bitterness, jealousy, revenge, selfishness, and anger. The upper one broadens into sympathy, forgiveness, love, altruism, and charity. At both levels, thought and feeling play their part. But the soul is common to all and learns the secrets of power by ascending and descending, by comparing feeling and thought, emotion and emotion. Feeling and thought, for example, correct and help each other. Thought meditates upon feeling and learns to discriminate between passions, ephemeral emotions and temporary losses of equilibrium on the one hand, and the higher and finer feelings arising from divine communion on the other. The soul benefits from these meditations and advances in the regulation of the emotions. As the experience deepens, a higher state develops composed of these philosophical meditations and victories over the emotions. This state, nourished by both feeling and thought, now expresses itself in nobler ideas, now in nobler actions. Feeling and thought are thus mutually fruitful, producing a unity of which each alone is incapable. For the coordination of forces which I have called spiritual equilibrium is the result, let us repeat, of both intuition and understanding. We must know our forces, their laws and relative values, and we must be guided by this wisdom in its progressive advance. To know is not necessarily to do. To act is not always to control intelligently. The well-coordinated individual is both masculine and feminine, both rational and intuitive, positive and receptive. Half of victory is the correct knowledge of the states through which one is passing. The other half is attitude adaptation, with due recognition of the evolutionary changes that follow any new application of power. So the process boils down to steady progress towards spiritual coordination through proper adjustment between the complementary phases of the inner life. The ideal is the proper distribution of time and energy among the various ends that are really worth pursuing in life. It is the adjustment between equanimity and organic rhythm. It is harmony between the inner and outer life, the individual and society. It is moderation in all things, even in zeal for spiritual development. It is both a life of action and a life of repose. All is organic, relative, but all is contributive. As such, this wise activity is a product of experience tempered by philosophy and made sacred by religion. Man may be born with it at some point, but today it is a crowning achievement of the enlightened soul. Chapter 13. A Vital Secret. How can a state of exalted spiritual feeling affect the body in the same way that any emotional change affects it? Why do the multitude respond when they meet with sympathy and peace? People feel the greater power and new dynamic attitudes result. Every man gradually regains his equilibrium. What a man can accomplish in the presence of a crowd can be repeated when he faces the crowd of the inner life, if with equal skill he rises supreme in the midst of a critical environment. For the soul is master of the inner as well as the outer forces, it is in touch with the body as well as with the mind. If you are a poorly coordinated person, of course you should not expect to suddenly control the forces that promote sanity of mind and body. 
But if you have trained your organism for years, you already possess habits by which you can not only control your temperament and the animal in you, but also the deeper activity which has the power of life and death. Suppose, for instance, you have been overtaxing the brain for many months. There is too much blood and consequently excessive heat in the brain. After a while, your organism can no longer stand the congestion and begins the process of expelling this superfluous heat. The heat descends into the throat and chest. If you are ignorant, you declare that you have contracted a terrible cold. Consequently, you try to remember when you were exposed. You fear pneumonia, possibly tuberculosis and death. Right here is the crucial point, the vital secret. Read these words thoughtfully and repeatedly. They convey truths of incalculable value to every living soul. As this condition increases, two courses open before you. If you get caught up in painful sensations, if you name them and allow anxious emotions to arise, call a doctor and take medicine. You may get pneumonia and you may die. But if you possess the invaluable self-control and wisdom of which I speak, you can in a few moments change the course of life. After that, you will be safe. It may be weeks before nature renews your health after the long excess, but you can rest easy and let the work be done. This statement would sound absurd unless the principle had been demonstrated. The crisis is as serious and requires as much wisdom as facing a murderous mob. You must summon all your powers of self-control. You must be calm. You must act quickly and you must conserve every atom of energy. With the balance of power in your hands at the critical moment, you can change the balance almost in an instant. For there is a critical point where the temperature is rising, where fears cry out for recognition, and the odds are seemingly on the other side. To give in to the oncoming wave is to immediately lose control. To dwell on the pain is to be engulfed by it. There is one and only one way at this moment, namely to turn, as one would in front of the angry crowd, toward that higher world surrounding the visible realm, summoning all your faith, peace and balance, the love of God and the inspiring ideal of Christ, then stay calm, calm, and even in the center calm as you pass through the turning point. Can this be accomplished for another? Yes, sometimes it is easier than getting the triumph alone. I once sat at the bedside of a nervous invalid who thought she was dying. A woman of usually remarkable clarity of vision, she was so deeply immersed in the sea of sensations that all was dark and ominous around her. The utmost calm was required, for the odds against me were momentarily increasing. The experience was conceivably like that of a tightrope walker crossing the Niagara River on a wire. It seemed to be over a great chasm between two countries. He had to keep his head perfectly steady, turning neither to the right nor to the left. He was not to allow emotions or sympathies to arise for a moment. He was to keep the balance of power as implacable as a statue until the strait was passed. Once passed, he could think and look around again. Isn't the reaction great after so much intense concentration? No, because it is not the nerves that hold, it is a higher power behind them. It is a spiritual experience. The opportunity to face grim death and conquer it comes rarely because it is not often that a person has faith to trust another. But there are those who have conquered death within themselves more than once, and, as I said before, this is usually more difficult. For amidst the raging sea of sensation, one must feel the peace and rest of heaven, the tranquility of eternity, as unaware of danger as a small child at play. One who has faced such a condition knows beyond doubt that there is literally a spiritual domain close to one from which one can draw a power, of a force far greater than any force in the physical or mental worlds. For those who do not yet feel the dominant presence, one can only say, it is a growth the culmination of months and years of steady advancement, in which one is faithful to the higher guidance of the last moment. Fundamentally, it is a matter of habit, the discrimination between and control of emotions, the measured growth of peace and balance, of increased faith in intuition and the stronger love of Christ. Above all, it is a product of severe experiences in life when, whipped and tested to the utmost, faith has the opportunity to do its perfect work. Every new or difficult experience is an occasion for the triumph of what I have called the real essence of life, the active part of us, as opposed to the thinking part. 
You notice this element in those who speak with power, rather than simply with words. The spirit speaks more than the letter. A word thus spoken carries with it a power that makes its impression. The word becomes flesh. This is the word that heals. It overcomes resistance and establishes a new habit. Newton's first law of motion is suggestive on this point. Every body continues in its state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line, unless forced to change that state by an external force. Habits illustrate the same law. If by a new dynamic attitude you overcome sufficient resistance to begin a new direction of bodily and mental energy, the vital forces will tend to keep moving in that direction unless prevented by an external force. The essential thing, therefore, is to give the new impulse to find the inner realm of heaven, the domain of peace and balance from which all things necessary inevitably follow. Do not make the process complex and difficult. Do not be metaphysical and abstract. Your strengths are here, your soul is here, God is here. Alternatives are constantly presenting themselves to you. Don't wait until you are sick. Start with the simplest occasions for self-control and character building. Decide whom you will serve, low or high, impatience or patience, hate or love, anger or forgiveness, yourself or others. Having chosen act, then stand firm. Remember that power tends to keep moving. Let it work. You will gain self-control with each victory. Minor victories will lead to major ones. In time, you will be able to master what at first seemed impossible. Chapter 14. A Personal Letter. Dear Grieving Heart, I long to speak to you as only the closest friend can, and I claim this privilege from you for the moment, since I know so well what your struggles mean. I too have passed through the pitfalls that now beset you. I too have wondered if I could pass safely, but in the most difficult moment, a helping hand sympathetically reached out to me, and I believe I can help you as a friend once helped me. I understand why life is heavy right now. Conditions are exasperating and you have a lot to bear, but you are not entirely to blame. You have a tendency to put yourself down, to discourage yourself, when in fact you are doing much better than you think you are. You have more ability than you suspect. Think for a moment about what you've overcome. Remember how bad the inheritance was and how you were severely disadvantaged. Many of the most troublesome tendencies have already been overcome, and you have much to be thankful for. You will soon reap the benefit of your efforts. Right now, you are in a transitional state where you cannot see clearly. Moreover, your physical condition is such that your whole mental state is affected by it, and sometimes when you condemn yourself, it is only the physical condition that is at fault. You are at the crossroads. Up to now, you have lived largely for yourself. You have been very personal, more so than you realize. You have been quick to take offense, always ready to defend yourself, inclined to lay the burden of blame on others. You have been unhappy, pessimistic, and, shall I say the word, selfish. Consequently, you have reaped what you sowed, and the world has seemed a terrible testing ground. Now, all this is changing. You are discontented with yourself. You do not know which way to turn in your distress. But remember, it is what you have been that distresses you, not what you are going to be. The fact that you are dissatisfied shows that a better self is triumphing. Hold on to that better self and let the old self die. Or rather, know that as you give attention to the new, the power of the old will be transmuted. Deep in your heart, you long to be selfless. Therefore, think of yourself as such. In your heart of hearts, you forgive people. Therefore, put away all feelings of recrimination and revenge. What does it matter if people are annoying? What does it matter if they trample on you? Learn to tolerate them and they will treat you much better. It is utterly absurd to respond. It is a waste of energy to be discouraged. Respect yourself and others will respect you. Be gentle and patient and speak in low, tender tones and others will gladly respond. It is all a matter of selflessness as opposed to selfishness. All that you suffer comes directly or indirectly from selfishness. Everything you long for will come when you lose the ego, so that you will find it. Having said this, I have said it all. Why should I repeat it or say more? If you see it, everything is settled. If not, I probably cannot make it clear, for each soul must see for itself. But be assured of this. You have my sincere sympathy. I know what the outcome will be, therefore I trust. From my heart I speak to you in sweet kinship. 
from my heart I give you all that I am that can help you, and an unwritten message will go with these words to your soul from mine. Chapter 15. The Secret of Character All who have watched the rise and fall of the bow of a long liner as it ascends and descends a high wave must have observed the splendid triumphs that a modern liner wins where older ships failed. Time and again, the approaching wave seems about to crash over the bow and sweep the decks, but just at the critical point, the liner gracefully rises above the looming crest, which quickly slides aft and loses its grandeur in the rolling mass punctuated by the churning churn of the tireless propellers. This noble victory is typical of equally splendid triumphs of the soul. In our illustration, the liner plunging beneath the swelling wave will represent experiences on the lower plane of life, while the one rising above will represent the mastery of which the higher self is capable. Here is a young woman, for example, who has spent several years away from home and has advanced beyond her parents, who have had few educational advantages. At home she had a tendency to be impatient and disagreeable. In the larger world of city life, she has grown intellectually strong and sweet-tempered. Returning home, she encounters the old tendencies that once held her prisoner. The almost irresistible temptation is to be as moody as ever. Old habits swirl toward her, like the threatening waves of the mid-ocean. Will she rise above them and advance triumphantly? Or will she be driven beneath the crest of the sea? It all depends on her self-awareness and her ability to hold on to her new life. If she is intensely self-conscious at the crucial moment, she will say, that is my dead self. That is what I used to be. I am done with that forever. Saying this, he will rise above a tendency that seems insurmountable. But if she yields to the old impulse, her waves will break and batter her until for a time her new life seems totally swamped. Probably every reader of these words occasionally returns to an environment where similar temptations are encountered. Almost everyone succumbs to some extent. Most dive in without knowing that they are giving in. All servitude to vices, habits and customs is of a similar character. For a large part of the details of daily conduct, we can assign no better reason than to admit that the rising tide of passion or social impulse swept over us and we rolled helplessly beneath it. Worse, society conspires to keep each of its members in subjection by insisting that a man cannot change his habits after a certain age. No dogma is more false. Never in our history have we been swept along when it is impossible at the time to rise above the wave. The only impediment is ignorance of the alternative. Once a man knows that he is potentially a modern ocean liner, he will witness a wonderful change. Our great shortcoming is that we don't try. A false philosophy has taken the life out of us. In our languid state we become more and more like animals. How low can a man sink? Man, did I say? Yes, perhaps a potential man. But man is truly such to the extent that he rises above what would have made him an animal, and worse, a beast. It is wonderful what one can overcome when the mind is alert and keen. Ordinarily, men think that the environment must change before the inner life changes. This is the radical defect in the doctrine of almost every socialist and social reformer. Radical socialism is a device for cowards who lack the manhood to be souls in the presence of ruthless corporations. The beggar is a coward. The man who complains that he cannot find work is another. I say this without qualification, knowing well that I will be severely criticized for saying it. No one was ever forced to wait long to find employment if he took his chance as the ocean liner surfs the waves. The main fault does not lie in our social system, however incorrect it may be nor does it lie in our environment, whether physical or social. The main fault lies in ourselves. A man can face any possible situation with such force that the world will find an instant need for him. Most men have been brought up with the false idea that they must have some vices. They have thought that there was at least one impulse within them that must always predominate over them and taint them. This is where the trouble begins in many cases. If a man dips on one occasion, he is likely to succumb in other situations. Eventually, he becomes a creature of impulse, a slave to habit. The same is true of woman. Her characteristic weakness is to give in at the wrong point. Sometimes in the great sea of life, the weather is calm and there is no need to be positive. But the glory of woman should be in her strength, not in her weakness. 
Every woman has the power to overcome the waves that tempt her to servitude. Every woman has within her that which will make her equal to the man who would want to be her master. In continually yielding, she forgets that she too has a right to stand erect. It is cowardly for both the oppressed worker and the oppressed wife to wait for society to change. What is it that makes society advance? It is the irresistible movement of those who refuse to put up with existing conditions. It is the activity of those who know no such word as failure. Time and again we live from week to week under a serious burden, praying that someone will take it off our back when at any moment we can stand upright and let it fall. The trouble with us is that we do not use our powers. This is true not only for many external conditions, but also for our physical and mental states. Nine-tenths of our aches and pains, our sorrows and fits of depression, remain with us because we stoop before them instead of rising above them. Each of our states of discouragement came gradually, at least slowly enough that, had we been alert from the beginning, we could have passed serenely over them. We are not yet half awake, we have believed that many situations were unconquerable, and so we have indolently capitulated. But there are fewer situations that require adjustment than for victory. Disease will be totally conquered at some point, as will all obstacles in our physical environment. Even death can be postponed 10, 20, yes, sometimes 50 years. A predominant fault with us is that we look too closely and constantly at the negative side. We regret, we despise ourselves, we give in to discouragement, and we become overly self-analytical and introspective. The present age is morally impotent. We need a revival of the fire and zeal of yesteryear. We have grown pathetically optimistic while expecting all things to correct themselves. God helps those who help themselves. He who does not risk does not win. Agnosticism is cowardice. It is weak-kneed indolence. It lies behind a fence and complains that we can know nothing of reality because lo and behold, all that comes to us from beyond is light shining through the cracks. But for one who travels on an express train, there are no cracks, there is no fence. The man of character achieves success by mastering the impossible. The wise man sees God through the unknowable. Obstacles are possibilities seen from the adverse side. The unknowable is man's own shadow, cast while his back is turned to the sun. The same conditions that seem overwhelming when viewed negatively at close range become aids to success when we awaken from our lethargy. Emerson said that man is a god in ruins, but man is more truly a god with his eyes set on the earth, afraid to lift them toward the sun. One who was once a god may in fact fall low and become a slave. This condition of servitude can persist for months. One who has been spiritually enlightened may become enveloped in the flesh, so that where he once spoke of the soul, he now speaks only of brain and nerves. But he is still a god. It was wrongly given advice or the influence of a mind that had no right to be influential that led to the fall. He who was once a master is now in the service of an inferior. He yielded where he might have triumphed. He plunged under the sea of boredom and fatigue when it would have been easy enough to brave the tide. It is a sorry state to be in this servile base. One of the most stormy situations in life is the enforced idleness of one who might have labored triumphantly had he not given in and thus ceased to be himself. It is remarkable to what depths the mighty can fall. Yet, amidst the apparent ruins, the God is there. No knowledge once acquired is ever lost. No power once acquired can ever be taken away. Even if physical incapacity intervenes, the soul will one day find a way to meet the wave. We are too prone to reflect on the limitations of knowledge, on the circumstances that warp the judgment of men. So we sometimes have a false charity, Sometimes we excuse ourselves when we should be ashamed to allow bodily sensations to color the vision of the soul. It is good to know that all experience is relative to our present state of development. It is important to learn that we see through the means of our education and bodily organs. However, it is much more important to know that we have higher powers with which we can almost instantly transcend these conditions. We can not only change the mental state, but rise above the body consciousness. A part may have to pass under the wave, but the higher self will cross it. Even heredity is only a lower wave. It is a tendency that may or may not become a permanent habit. 
The same is true of many trend flows that threaten misfortune. My horoscope may predict calamity at a certain time. At the lower level, whatever the stars seem to indicate may be true. The same is true of the fate of the one whom the palmister or any other magician may prophesy. That man is a fool who believes in such a prophecy. Such things are the playthings of cowards and idlers. Every man who has breathed the pure air of the upper zone knows that he can resort to expedients that make the stars not matter. At the very moment when his ship seems about to be engulfed by impending doom, he can rise as serenely above it as if it were a ripple in a tiny stream. He who has learned to ride the waves need pay no attention to the signs of the weather. Any environment is favorable to a man of character. We are too much inclined to procrastinate until the ideal day. Every day is ideal for the enlightened soul. If a man wishes to write a book, for instance, he thinks he must have a quiet, secluded study. For several years, I have made it a point to do some literary work in the most disturbed surroundings. On the coldest day of the winter and the hottest of the conquered summer, I brought my notes from below when on board ship in the midst of a hurricane and found that I could easily plunge into philosophical composition. If I find it easy to maintain my doctrine when I am with friends, then let him try me with those who are not sympathetic. The mind is in an indolent state when one reads a book or listens to a sermon without raising objections. A man who is a slave to a thermometer is likely to cringe at many other things. The same day is propitious or not for the same man in two moods. There is a tide in the affairs of men, and occasion makes the man. However, when man is ready, the occasion comes when he can make or break himself. Supply and demand are equal. At every moment as we sail the sea of life, a wave approaches us. Wise is he who is preparing for the nearest wave. Other writers have noted many secrets of character besides the one considered here. But by now the reader has discovered the essential idea which differentiates each secret from the usual treatment of the subjects here discussed. There are innumerable treatises on the moral and spiritual life abounding in beautiful descriptions of ethics and religion. There is abundant advice as to self-control, but there is a tendency to stop at the edge of the theoretical world. The present doctrine demands the most concrete and profound action. Without knowledge of the forces acting upon the soul, the best advice may be useless. Without a method of controlling the emotions, habits and lower levels of consciousness, penetration into the subjective world may end in mere introspection. But with a clue to the powers that lie beyond, one can pass the barrier where vast multitudes have stopped in despair. There are many spiritual secrets too that have not been discussed here. Little has been said about love and less about service. Christ has not been mentioned as often as some would wish. Nor have we written about those supreme moments when it is not the individual who dominates but the dependence is on prayer, the sweet peace of Christ, the ever watchful care of the Father. But it is assumed that the highest that each reader's life or religion has brought him is here, the source of inspiration for that part of our conduct, which does come within human control. Do not let your vision fade with only the inner eye to contemplate it. Let it be objectified. Do not be religious only in thought. Be religious in conduct. Do not apply your religion only in one department. Be organically religious and let no function of your life be omitted. This book is intended to provide the link in the method so that thought and life may finally unite. Therefore, preserve all that has enriched your life, your well-developed physical habits, as well as your more spiritual ideals. But add to these. Expand your boundaries and move into the realm of the nobly practical. When you have succeeded, as this book promises you can, with patience, moderation and faith, you will be inspired with new zeal for service. For you will mingle with your fellows as a brother. Your presence, your life will speak above words and you will always have a message for the undisciplined, the desperate and the afflicted. The time is coming when no man will be truly considered a man of character unless he is thus remarkably practical. The age of argumentation and speculation is passing away. The age of brute impulse, of unprotected feeling, has been dying daily. Man is beginning to control himself as an individual. He will soon begin to own himself as a social being. A wonderful change in all departments of social life will follow. Disease will be conquered 
and with it pain in many of its forms. Man will not be a being of moods, he will be the master of the moods that now color and discolor our philosophy. And the clearer vision to come will convince men once and for all that, truly to know life, one must first conquer it. Of that sublime flood of light which occasionally bursts upon the soul, one cannot so easily speak as of the conduct which should follow. Before we take our leave, however, let us share at least a glimmer of that shining presence that we may suggest where we cannot describe, hint where it would be sacrilege to classify and worship where we cannot reveal the law or the secret. Chapter 16. Spiritual Laws The supreme evidence of a spiritual realm is the fact that our highest feelings and ideas make themselves known at a time and under conditions which we cannot fully control. While we can rationally apply the illusion hypothesis, we are compelled to state that there is no spiritual realm with which we are in immediate relationship. So far also, insofar as our experiences are within the power of the will, we have not found the highest evidence. But when we must necessarily confess that unexpectedly the spirit makes its presence known, we are compelled to admit that there is indeed a higher law, so that it is not the soul that willingly seeks and masters the spirit, but it is the spirit that reveals itself to the soul. In moving from the consideration of our more voluntary life to this higher range of spiritual perceptions, however, we are not arguing for anything inconsistent with the art of self-control, the art of character building. We are simply highlighting a factor that has played its role from the beginning. We are considering transfigured self-control, the art of success inspired by the higher ideal for which the self, with all its artifices, was bred. Especially is the presence of this immediately surrounding spiritual realm involved in critical moments where the soul faces illness and the threat of death. The utmost that self-control can achieve is needed. However, beyond and above that, there is something with which in its most critical moments the soul adjusts itself and without which these greatest triumphs could not be won. In this chapter, I will develop some of the implications of this higher experience, always with the reservation that we know it only in part, and point out some of the methods by which we can consciously prepare ourselves for its coming. I will leave aside the questionable experiences, where we do not know whether we are simply contemplating ourselves, our physical activities, or the characteristics of some excarnate spirit, and confine myself to the unmistakable evidences of the peace and power, the love and wisdom, of that spirit of spirits whom we call the Father. I shall not attempt to prove the authenticity of these experiences. Their character is their proof. There is no other. If you have perceived his presence, you know it. If you have not, you do not know it. And this ends any argument. However, I do not mean to imply that these experiences are irrational, but that one must sense their presence before one can clarify their reason. The situation is comparable to our knowledge of the physical world. We do not argue that the physical world exists, hoping thereby to prove it to another. We draw attention to the fact that we awaken to existence and find the world here. We distinguish between thoughts that we direct at will in our minds and sensations that come to us from outside, despite our will. For example, there is a great difference between fantasy and the sensations described as hot and cold. Fantasy we can put it out of our minds as unreal or focus on it at will, but the sensation of heat or cold is imposed on us. To free ourselves from it, we are forced to withdraw our physical organisms from the hot or cold environment. From the sensations we are forced to feel, we develop a conception of a world order arising from an ultimate self-existent reality. By the same process, we can reason logically from effect to cause, when we find ourselves in the presence of beauty, peace, love, and wisdom. Surely the logical process is so sound, we have as good reason to suppose that reality is spiritual as to regard it as the ultimate foundation of the rock. I have called attention to the fact that we know which states of consciousness come from without in contrast to the will. The same law of contrast is exemplified in experiences in which we feel the presence of spirit. For example, suppose one is in the depths of uncertainty about practical matters, involved in doubts about fundamental principles or truths. There is no better illustration of our finitude. 
We struggle and contend, question and seek advice. We find ourselves on the verge of a solution to a difficult problem, but that question depends on another, and that in turn, on something else. Everything is in a sea of doubt. We are beset by counter-influences and temptations. Doubt about minor problems leads to doubt about major questions, until we wonder if divine guidance is possible. We doubt the truth. We doubt the existence of God. This mental confusion sometimes continues for months. Suddenly, in the darkest hour, in a totally unexpected moment, the sky clears, and once again we behold the beatific vision. The transformation is marvelous. Almost in the twinkling of an eye, the dark shades of doubt are illuminated by the beautiful lights and shadows of transcendent perception. Once again, spirit is consciously with us. Once again, all is conviction, repose, and confidence. The path is so clear, the solution so simple, that we wonder equally at our stupidity and our anguish. This triumph of the spirit is typical of the experiences whose law I propose to describe. When we sink into the depths, we know how small the personal thing is. When the spirit comes, we realize its greatness, compared to the small doubts that expressed our lack of faith. By contrast, we know that there is a wisdom present which far surpasses the highest reaches of self-conscious thought, so that all other sources of inspiration are of little importance. Here is the spiritual ideal. Once convinced by these clearly defined experiences that we live close to the sources of wisdom, power and love, one discovers the possibility that every consequent act in life may be inspired by spirit. To live close to God, that is the ideal. To dwell in the fountain of truth, the home of peace and beauty. To speak with power, to move with that strength which will carry all obstacles before it. How can this end be achieved? Receptivity is obviously an essential element. We know from experience that if we try to be receptive, we often fail. But by an eternal law, we know that when, in the midst of doubt, the Father came, it must have been because at that moment our organism offered less resistance, and so we can at least train ourselves subconsciously. We can confidently believe that at any moment the Spirit is likely to reveal Himself and adapt our life accordingly. Moreover, it is clear that Spirit comes only when it is really needed. While it is better for us to work alone, we are left to human resources. When we have had the benefit of personal experience, the path becomes clearer. To illustrate, suppose one is called to the bedside of a sick person to bring the help of the Spirit at a time when one possesses little power. To cry for help is in vain. One must work alone, guided by the memory of past experiences. Then comes a critical moment, and lo and behold, at that instant, one feels an unusual sense of power. At other times, one must work and call all hopeful thoughts to the rescue. Now one is hardly more than a channel for a higher power, an instrument through which greater results are realized than could have been accomplished by mere human thought. Do not misunderstand me. I do not say that the great spirit of the universe pays specific attention to this one sufferer and chooses you or me as an instrument. But by this higher law, the greater need subconsciously creates a deeper receptivity and the soul is open to that presence which, like the sun, spreads its life-giving light over all. Therefore we can be assured that, when the greatest need arises, we will be empowered, if it is wise. If our hands are tied, we can know that for some reason, as yet unclear, it was not wise for us to do the decisive work. Therefore we can confidently await divine inspiration. In this preparation for spiritual vision, we must remind ourselves again of the manifold character of human nature and consequently of the need for adjustment, beauty. When a man contemplates the glory of the higher vision, he tends to forget the artistic ideal. Therefore, he makes spirituality a specialty and inculcates it as an exclusive theory. The spiritual life quickly becomes odious if nothing else is preached. It is not the theorist who is most faithful, it is the man who lives quietly. The more truly spiritual, the less you will hear from him about spirituality. The spiritual man is so little inclined to flaunt his highest feelings that you must draw him out, you must study his conduct. For genuine spirituality is an almost unconscious accompaniment of the life of service, the growth of peace, the mastery of love. The spiritual is not an end to be sought in itself, as if there were a spiritual quality or realm distinct from any other. 
The ideal is to elevate all conduct, to purify all thought, to bring higher consciousness to all. The spiritual realm with which we are in contact is, in the deepest truth, the creative life of all planes. There is no point where the spiritual ceases and something else begins. The tendency of the spiritual devotee in all ages has been toward acceptance of a narrow segment of the great whole of life. The same tendency is strong today. The spiritual is still set aside in a vague and abstract realm by itself. The fanatic despises the external, the physical, the social or the artistic as if he could cheat the universe and become spiritual by ignoring rather than including these aspects. And so we find him maimed, lame or ugly. The artist knows best. Art is symmetrical. It takes into account anatomy, strength, simplicity, light, shadow, perspective, proportion and all the other distinctions and essentials by the synthesis of which the highest ideals of beauty are expressed. It is moderate, exhaustive. It pays attention both to the training of the eye and to the quickening of inner perfection. For beauty is neither wholly external nor wholly internal. So don't be too subjective, too analytical, too receptive or too on guard against being deceived by false prophets. But never belittle the intellect. It is more unfortunate to be too emotional than to be too intellectual. For the intellect is self-protective, while emotion succumbs to all sorts of subtleties. He who never gives himself completely to the highest feelings never knows their true value. He, however, who does not reason after he has enjoyed, surely deprives himself of a necessary experience. In the same way, people play their part in one's spiritual growth, but they legitimately possess only limited influence. Many spiritually minded people begin their higher life through discipleship. But woe to him if he expects perfection from his teacher. People are interesting and useful if we do not get too close, come closer, and the illusion disappears. As soon as limitations are seen, we quickly move away. If we had not erected idols, there would have been no fall. The cult of personality has its lessons, however. We learn after a while that every man is riddled with defects so that he can be a good specialist. From him, we can learn in one respect. He has seen life from a particular point of view. That point of view will surely be instructive, but it is only one among thousands. Let us listen and absorb as he expounds only this, then move on. People are secondary. As long as we follow them, we lack balance. What people give us is second-hand. Only from nature and God can we learn first-hand. The spiritual shines above all. Why stand behind a man and try to look through him? Many these days are cultivating selfishness, if not egotism, under the illusion that they are pursuing the true ideal. Thus, eccentricity is emphasized instead of individuality. You will only hear the lyrical expression of spirit from those who have refined their instruments until nothing is said for effect, but because there is a correspondence between the organism of the messenger and the sweet word of truth he brings. When his whole life tells the same story, you will know that he really believes what he is saying. Then his gospel is not a theory, it is life. It comes charged with power, carrying with it that quality of the heart, that emphasis of the soul, which assures you that it is genuine and unselfish. That message which is pronounced for the sake of the spirit is not even presented for the sake of doing good. When we strive to do good, we have some person or group of people in mind. But what does the most good in the world is expressed simply because one had something to say. Art knows no higher ideal than art for art's sake. Even the practice of going into silence to become receptive and relaxed can be carried to excess. Meditation is worthwhile if it's the right kind and if you know what you're looking for. But it is so easy to overdo it. For most, it would certainly be better to pick up a volume by some seer or poet and read for a while until some phrase strikes a chord. Then one can follow the creative thought accurately, thoroughly, and at one's own pace. Such thinking clears the mind, sharpens the faculties, and refines the whole organism. It invites balance. Because it is balanced thinking, it is artistic. The mind becomes sharper year by year. Language becomes more logical, thought more pure and refined. Precise analysis, the examination of fine ethical distinctions is as essential as the apprehension of great totalities. The universe is infinitely small as well as infinitely large. Hoover really wants to know must know in detail as well as in general. 
the cultivation of discernment is as important as the development of empathy. All things are lower and higher, and if you are not discriminating, you cannot classify. Many teachers advise the spiritual man to face forward and never backward, to concentrate on the positive and never on the negative. We are told, with good reason, to be constructive. We are warned not to be analytical. However, if I disregard the intellect as analytical, I am likely to push away from the mind precisely that consideration, which, if considered rationally, would enable me to maintain balance. To refuse to analyze is to lay the foundation for the cult of personality. The history of human nature shows that idols fall when people are awake enough to detect defects. Idol worship is a kind of sleep. It numbs sensibilities and dulls thinking. Be on guard when you are told not to ask questions. How can you build unless you have something to build with? If you wish to erect a building, you must lay your foundations wide and deep. You must carefully select your materials and examine them critically to avoid fatal flaws. Should one be less fastidious in scrutinizing those ideas and feelings upon which it is said that one can build for the ages in the higher realm? However, it is always true that one must be willing to give up everything. Do not insist on your theories of art, your metaphysics or your social scheme. Be ready to change your life in any respect, willing to give up any plan or make your home anywhere. But when you have consecrated the thinker, the artist, the worker, you will find that all these fragments of yourself are necessary. I insist that the spirit is rich and man must be richly developed to express divine beauty, truth, goodness and love. The artist, consecrated to art for art's sake, has found the inner realm in his own way. Therefore, do not condemn him because he considers essential what is insignificant to you. The philosopher, seeking to perfect a system of ultimate principles, has felt the same divine touch. And what is dark and gloomy to you is luminous and inspiring to him. The good man is ridiculed by the wit only because the wit does not know the inner meaning of the good man's action. The lover is considered unbalanced because he sees so much value and beauty in a seemingly ordinary lover, but he is the one who has entered the inner sanctum of his heart and communed with his flawless soul. The essential thing is to find the divine center. If men discover that, don't complain. It is understood that each will express himself in his own way. Selfishness, after all, is lack of symmetry. We cling to something, demanding that it be ours. We become absorbed in a single sensation and suffer pain. We try to force people to do our will, and so we despoil and degrade. But when we are selfless, we are upright. We grant freedom to all others to be upright as well. We covet nothing and so we have everything. We refuse to feed an insignificant pain so it disappears. So selflessness is integrity. No man is truly whole unless he looks beyond himself to that larger whole of which he is a part. That is why ultimately the law of spiritual evolution is beyond human control. It is an inartistic motive that impels us to know the how and why of the most divine inspiration as if we would chemically dissolve love to see what it is made of. Such motives are only fragments. The true presence is a whole. The same contrast holds true for the doubts I spoke of at the beginning. A doubt is a single point of view, while an idea is a set of points of view. All that one saw in each state of doubt is there, but it is contemplated as a plant is seen in sunlight, surrounded by a boundless world. Looked at from the negative point of view, the assimilative capacity of a plant is so small that it seems helpless. Looked at from above and around, it is beautiful, and the observer never thinks of limitations. Many times we find ourselves in a similar situation, for the spirit to enlighten you or me seems impossible. The receiving organism would surely discolor the divine light. The little light that managed to penetrate our thick skulls would not be divine by the time it reached us, so we hesitate and argue but the impossible is achieved when our consciousness shifts to the perfect whole. After all, there is no part of the plant that does not feel the power of the sun's rays, and this mastery of all obstacles is poor in comparison with the achievements of spirit when it breaks through our doubts. Pursue your finite thoughts then when they come. Let them fill your empty hours, but forget not that they are finite and inartistic. From these very fragments, 
whose law of association you have sought in vain, the great artist can create a fair and peaceful scene before which you will gaze in wonder. Not one piece will be missing, nor will there be one too many. Such is always the mystery of transcendental art. It fulfills every purpose. It is as economical and practical as it is divine and beautiful. Man, imitating the universal power, will do well to remember that only by perfection in all will he attain perfection anywhere. But I have spoken enough about the part and the whole to be tedious. I turn finally to the social side of these spiritual principles. While it is true that the real essence is transmitted to us, not taken from us, we can at least train our organisms to be ready for the higher work, and the higher is indisputably social. From the added power of two kindred souls will arise a still greater social power, and, when many men and women are truly married, a leavening force will be sent forth into the world from the home, such as has never been known before. In this way will come the final social regeneration. One cannot graft spirituality into the social state from without, any more than one can attain the kingdom by first seeking the things that are promised to be added. All spiritualization must come from within, proceeding from the center to the circumference. It is the living power that touches the soul, then vivifies the outer life. And so it must first touch souls, then groups of souls, and finally great masses of souls, until the impetus is so great that nothing can resist it. True social life, then, is artistic. It robs man of nothing. It beautifies all that he has. Thus the great spiritual law, enunciated so long ago, takes on new importance when we realize the social changes that must follow as men and women find the greater kingdom of heaven. Individual composure, the personal vision of the spirit, is only the beginning of the larger spiritual life. Man has a long way to go before he becomes truly social. Spiritual centers will grow by aggregation as cells once grew, until human society is truly an organism. Now society is a collection of fragments. As our doubts make war, so men and nations make war with each other, waiting for the divine moment when the part will find rest in the whole. But as our doubts are finally resolved, so will these fragmentary groups of men and women be drawn together. The power of powers is working to bring about this harmony, hence the efforts and the conflicts. If you are convinced of the universality of this law for yourself, you must see that it applies to all men. Once convinced, each of us has a great work to do to point out the law, for it has little recognition in the world. Few adopt the rule that Jesus laid down. Most people are specialists, partisans. Whoever wants to be truly spiritual must be universal. And so the practical rule for everyone is this. Wherever you are, whoever you are, choose one of these paths to the universal. Pursue art for art's sake, truth for truth's sake, or any of the higher ideals of service and education, and follow it as far as you can. Someday you will awaken to the happy discovery that in truly pursuing one you have sought all, that the beautiful is good, ethical, that the ethical is artistic, that truth is both beautiful and good. Moreover, you will learn that no part, no organ, is complete by itself. All are dependent, all are mutually useful. Nothing is absolute. If you want to find all this, if you want to be part of this eternal harmony, seek first the spirit, the creative life, the pure white light. Chapter 17. The Message of a Soul. Peace be with you. Peace. The peace that passes all understanding I bring from that eternal world where love and wisdom reign. For though I am a humble soul, one who does not boast of himself, I have access to a higher realm, and he would be extremely unfaithful who would be silent when his lips have learned, at least hesitatingly, to speak with the spiritual tongue. I live, like you too, in two worlds. I am, like you, two beings. With one tongue I could address you about the weather, the latest fashion or the stock market, and you could return me surface for surface. But if I address you with the tongue of an angel, will you not respond just the same? Do you realize how many occasions we pass up when we could speak as only angels speak, were it not for pride, timidity, or servility based on habit? It is said that angels once spoke to men on earth, and we believe it historically. 
but today many are ashamed to express the best in them, and some have become cold and sterile. It is also rumored that every man and woman of us came as an angel from heaven, pure, innocent, and true, but that the world corrupted us. We are told that we must become as little children again. We also believe this, theoretically. There are many who know the way, but do not follow it. However, each of us is an angel in heaven right now. Nothing has separated us from divine love and wisdom. Nothing has corrupted us. Nothing can corrupt the soul. Once pure, always pure. The soul is always an angel of God. The heart never loves less sincerely because the body grows old and life becomes complicated. Behind the illusions of the mind's fond conceptions and fancies, the faith of the soul is as firm as ever. The inner man is as zealous for truth as he is young and alert. The soul never grows old, never really yields to the petrifying tendencies of the flesh. Though the body staggers and the sight clouds, the soul is as upright and intuitive as in its day of birth. We may think that our pristine purity is lost. We may think that we do not believe in God, but this apparent despair or skepticism is only temporary and superficial. These are ancient truths, very ancient, but we forget them in our servitude. In reality, the soul passes lightly from joy to sorrow, from pain to ecstasy, touching or watching serenely where it seems to sink and be overcome. The illusion is on the carnal side, not the spiritual. Never came a pain so deep or an affliction so wearing that it actually imprisoned the soul. More than half the time we allow ourselves to become so burdened with the flesh that the soul seems to be in bondage there. We talk as if this body were the soul, as if you and I were creatures of weather, food and money. But consciousness has withdrawn from the real man, that is all. The soul lives at liberty and will soon narrate its dreams upon dreams. Meanwhile, there are some who even now actually live, conscious of both lower and higher dreams. What they see and say belies the poor pretensions of the lower man. It is the higher man who really lives. Stop for a moment in the midst of the restless, enraged child that you are and be a man, an angel. You will find that a part of you is quiet, only the surface is disturbed. The waves of passion and fear do not touch the bottom. Beneath the passing storm, there is a solid being. Above the fog, there is a self that can laugh at the childish game below. How absurd to be buffeted by the tempest when one can descend to the depths of the silent ocean or rise to a height where all is light and clear. But how terrible is the tempest, you say, and how pitiful that thousands should be tossed and beaten. See how they groan and weep. True, but should one think only of that? Should one mingle fears with the afflicted and forget that one could be an angel of peace? Yet, if I withdraw from there, when I return, the storm still rages and I helplessly contemplate its fury. Is that so? Then you have not reached the peaceful heights, for to go thither and return is to come laden with peace and strong to conquer. Turn with me thence and let us gaze together at the ineffable vision. All around us, even where hearts are afflicted and man is sordid, there is another world which the lower senses see not, but which the soul sees as a poet sees a sunset. That world means nothing, to those to whom kind fortune has not revealed it spiritually. You might argue forever with one who has never felt its sweet peace and fail as the poet and the musician fail when they try to tell what beauties they have seen in nature. To one who sees only shapeless rocks or hears only ugly dissonances. However, I am not only speaking of what poetry and music sing of a passing beauty or a half-trapped sound. I speak of that sublime fullness which the musician and the poet saw but of which they only expressed now and then a fragment. Or let us say that they heard a melody which passed all power to emulate, that this which the world hastens to hear is only the middle note whose height and depth they could not compress into their earthly symphony. There is a region where all inspiration is one, where the soul breathes a hidden air from which a little may be exhaled as poetry or music, love, wisdom, peace or beauty. There all men are equal. There they are united. One spirit touches all and each one reports as he wills or as he can. Yet every soul has moments when it uses the spiritual tongue. Every soul understands it. It would be useless for anyone, however conditioned, to pretend that he does not understand it. Our English and our Pali, our Sanskrit and our German have been given to us to hide thought. 
With these we erect barriers behind which we feed rancor and selfishness, but no man ever hid his soul. Some may not have eyes to see, or think they have none. But the vision is there to be seen. In love and peace, in sympathy, you can talk to any man, whatever his acquired tongue, and be understood. This brotherly tongue no man ever acquired. All were born with it. All lives express it in some measure. Donate of yourself and no man under the sunny sky can resist you. A man can neither doubt nor contend when he hears that inner voice, moved by the spirit of giving. To doubt would be like doubting himself, and no man ever really did that. To struggle would be to strike at his own heart. Yet the more we emerge from that realm, where of all places one can be most truly alone, the more different we are. These signs and symbols of our earthly humanity are so many instruments of the infinite. Every man feels himself, as it were, infinite. As we use words here below, so rich are the resources of the eternal world, all of which seem to be in turn the possession of each one. Again, when I enter that sacred world, it is not to lose myself. I am as truly myself as when I grab a torch and dive into a huge cave. In fact, I am my true self when I live there, even though I never seem so insignificant. What you hear from me at other times is some idea or emotion disguised as myself. In short, there is a wholeness of life so glorious that our fragmentary displays are dull and ugly in comparison. If I were to attempt a description of what the soul sees when it is integrated and unveiled, all you would see in the picture would be a faint glow, perhaps suggesting to you the inexpressible peace, but it would be more likely to be elusive. But it was not mere thinness that the soul saw, nor was it that elusive peace in which it lived. We have been educated to associate the illuminating radiance with spirits too pure to dwell on earth, or to regard it as the glory of the Christ alone. So we have closed our eyes when we might have beheld transfigured souls. Do you know what radiant beauty belonged to some who have lived on earth, to some who dwell here now? Have you ever tried to imagine the angelic part of those nearest and dearest? The few facts that history records are only a fraction of the life that some have spread while they were here. It is the deeds that attract the attention of the masses that are recorded. Or maybe a man gets the glory while a woman did the deed. Often it is the poorer part that is repeated over the centuries. There was no chronicler to bear witness to the triumphs and privations of the soul. And what seems to be done by one man or woman may be the work of many souls, present or absent. For in the upper world, there is no space. Souls who are kindred form one great family. That is why true men and women of genius cry out, not for us, not for us. But remember that radiant souls are not rare. You and I become radiant too, in our humble way, when we reach our true state. Procrastination is the thief of the soul. We always excuse ourselves from entering the radiant day, as if begging the powers of darkness. Just a few more nights to be devils. But know this, the only way a man can be a devil is to descend. For every man is also an angel. There is not an iota of evil in the upper world. Deep down, every man wants to be good. A high ecclesiastic would chide me for speaking so well of man. He would insist that I paint the blackness of sin. But alas, how many spend so much time drawing the black veil that there is no time left to paint the brightness of the spirit? I am now delivering the message of the soul, not recording what men think. In the spiritual world, the soul is as old as a thousand millennia. It looks before and after without limit, and in all that vast domain it sees no darkness. Light and darkness, like summer and winter, are seasons of earthly progress, conveniences of the lower world. Above the clouds of sensual is light, for the darkest valleys are seen from the standpoint of divine radiance. In that world things are not so easily described in terms of growth as in terms of being. The soul does not simply become light, it is light. This seems paradoxical. Yet the spiritual world is at once the basis of growth, the source of all evolution, and the permanent reality that neither changes nor fades. So it is in human life. We live in two worlds. It is possible to see a thousand miles or years with the eye of the soul, but to be compelled to take every step with the feet of the flesh. One ascends to that pure world to learn that a far more glorious life is possible. However, one must pick up the visible round of work where it left off when the momentous hour came. 
Why? Because before the soul is this great ideal, to ascend from earth until there is only heaven. Few are those who know, as they ascend, to what heights they are ascending, hence the apparent hopelessness and superficial atheism. But in the meantime there is that in us which knows all, and when we do not see the way we can safely trust, every ideal will merge into a greater one, every achievement will pale before a nobler feat yet to be accomplished. The soul knows no stopping place, it ever advances but always in the same kindred with the eternal spirit. This is its joy. This is its destiny. From far and near it whispers its gentle messages. From the heart of hearts it draws the gift of love. He who listens with gentleness shall hear her sweet intonations. He who is well balanced will walk in the solitudes of the spirit. Love and wisdom, joy, peace and beauty. These are the words, these are the long and deep harmonies, in the symphony of the soul.